Marissa ducked out of their eyeless line of sight, clamping a hand over her mouth and nose to stop the sound of her breathing from reaching their awful, earless heads. Seeing the staff walking around during the day cycle was hardly an uncommon occurrence, although there were usually many more of them at night. At least the lights being on made it easier to spot them, but it made hiding virtually impossible. She'd gotten much quicker at climbing up the towering metal shelves, and knew how many levels to go up in order to avoid being spotted. There she lay flat on her front, careful not to crush the valuable object she had tucked in her other arm, pressed against her chest. Still keeping her breaths masked, she watched the three misshapen creatures shambling around below. Looking at them was still enough to make her skin crawl. That much hadn't changed. Marissa figured it would take maybe more than a year of being trapped there for the staff to feel even marginally less unsettling. Everything about them just felt fundamentally, intrinsically wrong. The disproportionate limbs, the vacancy of any and all features or expressions on their blank faces, the inhuman voice they somehow spoke during the night cycle. But most of all, the thing that bothered her was how, even with all those inaccuracies that made it clear they weren't human, they were still shaped like humans. When it wasn't terrifying her, it made Marissa feel confused. Why not have multiple arms? Why not have jaws of razor-sharp teeth or bladed hands or enough eyes to see in 360 degrees at once? What was the point of keeping that two-armed, two-legged humanoid shape? It was as if they were trying to fool people or mocking them. The trio lurked around beneath her, the elongated necks lifting their heads to just short of the shelf Marissa was hiding on. She inched away as one came closer, hoping it wouldn't look up and spot her. Even though they were normally docile during the day cycle, she couldn't risk being seen in case it provoked them. While the lights were on, they normally ignored people. Some of the inhabitants of her settlement had even boasted about hurling cold meatballs at the staff during the day without eliciting so much as a reaction from them. They were lying, just posers, she had thought at the time. Hannah had even told them to their faces that they were just trying to seem tough. Marissa suppressed the urge to laugh, even quietly, at the memory. Her heart suddenly jolted beneath her ribs as she remembered the valuable object she had in her arm. In her mind, the idea rang out that shifting her body weight even as slightly as she had just done was enough to smash it to pieces, but she couldn't check not without causing enough noise to attract the three staff members. She tried rolling to her side, feeling some resistance behind her. Then, a loud noise as a calyx fell from the shelf and clattered to the ground. Before she could even look at the three staff, not even waiting for them to react, Marissa was on her feet again, climbing up the tall shelves. She tucked the precious object into her jacket, freeing both her hands to aid her climb. Every wobble of the warehouse shelves threatened to bring it careening down toppling into the neighboring unit, either crushing her under the weight of all the wood plastic composite panels falling off of the shelves, or leaving her winded and hurt enough for the staff to catch her. But not one of the threats to her safety deterred her from reaching the top of the enormous shelves in record time. The pounding of her pulse, loud enough to hear it against her eardrums, didn't distract her as she rushed across the length of the highest shelf, then leaped with ease to the one running parallel. To anyone else, she would have seemed crazy. Then again, wasn't love meant to make people do crazy things? Like trying to evade the staff with a stolen IKEA clock secured under her jacket. Marissa couldn't even afford herself a momentary glance over her shoulder at the staff below. If they were even still at ground level and hadn't started climbing up the shelves to chase her. Luckily, being this high up made it easier to navigate the endless, sprawling store surrounding her. In the distance, over rows and rows of warehouse shelves, she could see the showroom area, filled with model kitchens and bedrooms, knowing they too stretched out like an unending labyrinth of display furniture. A little over a year ago, when she first arrived, getting lost was almost a certainty. Now Marissa could navigate with ease. After all, she'd had a good teacher. She still remembered the day she arrived, even though the months since had felt like entire years. Things had been so much more complicated when she left home to buy some easy-to-assemble furniture for her new apartment. There were budgets and bills to think about, expenses and taxes, and what the heck to make for dinner when she got back. A million things to think about and what felt like hardly enough time to tackle each one. In here, things were much simpler. It was a day cycle or night. You were at camp 
or in the food hall gathering supplies. You could see the staff, or you couldn't. You were alive, or you were dead. It had only been a half hour or so after she stepped inside the IKEA on the edge of town for Marissa to realize she hadn't seen anyone else in the store since she arrived. Calling out for anyone else, she'd been met with her own voice being echoed back at her. Again, it was almost like someone was mocking her for getting lost. Retracing her steps, she tried making her way back to the front entrance, only to be met with more and more repeated showrooms. Then, the lights had gone out, plunging the whole place into darkness. She floated between the numerous living rooms made up of pristine IKEA furniture, guided by the dim white light of her phone's flashlight, gradually draining its already dwindling battery. Marissa had been trembling, terrified that she'd somehow been locked in after closing time, but that didn't make sense at all. It had been midday when she got to the store. Surely it wouldn't be closing so soon. And even if it was, the place had gotten way too dark, pitch black almost. It seemed like it was closer to the middle of the night than the middle of the day. Then she caught sight of something moving out of the corner of her eye. She froze on the spot, uncertain if she was jumping at shadows cast by her phone's light. But then, it moved, striding out from an aisle with such speed that made Marissa scream, as did the fact it was missing a face. The staff member was easily four feet taller than her, with crooked fingers at the tips of elongated arms that protruded from the sleeves of its bright yellow polo shirt. It came towards her, arms outstretched, and Marissa turned to run. The store is now closed. Please exit the building, came its voice behind her, following every squeak of her sneakers against the floor. Hide. She needed to find somewhere to hide from whatever the creature was that was chasing her. Back then, Marissa hadn't had the level of practice that she had a year later. She rushed into a display kitchen, ducking between various different sides of metods and noxholts, looking for something big enough for her to fit inside. There, a refrigerator one of the big cabinet ones. It was just a display model, not connected to an outlet, so the inside wouldn't be cold. She flung open the metallic doors, only to be met with rows and rows of clear shelves. Frantically, Marissa started grabbing the shelves and retching them out of the refrigerator, letting them clatter to the floor as she cleared herself enough room to clamper inside and pull the door shut behind her. She hadn't expected the creature pursuing her to notice the shelves strewn over the floor. Even inside the dark, inactive fridge, she could hear footsteps, the faceless thing patrolling the display kitchen outside, occasionally punctuating brief silent pauses with, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Did that mean it knew where she was? Or was it just repeating the phrase because that was all it knew how to say? So many questions racked Marissa's frightened mind as the footsteps outside inched closer to her hiding place. A misshapen hand flung the refrigerator doors open with enough force to wrench them both off their hinges and send them clattering to the floor, wrecking the nearby kitchen. Marissa was screaming even louder as the creature towered over her, about to reach into the fridge to grab her. Something sailed through the air and struck the staff member in the head. It turned out to be a Chiafron plant pot that shattered on impact causing the faceless creature to stagger backwards, reeling from the blow. Just as it turned to face its attacker, the staff member was met by an oncoming boot striking it sharply in the area where its face would have been. As someone swung towards it with a long line of Natchezmin bedsheets, fastened tightly together reaching all the way up to the fluorescent lights above, the creature repeated its ominous phrase, almost as a substitute for being unable to roar or snarl to scare its opponent. Above her head, Marissa heard the heavy thump of something landing on top of the refrigerator. It sounded like a person. Whoever they were, they leaped down towards the staff member. A makeshift club raised above their head they had brought swinging downwards at the creature, slamming into its arm with an almighty crack. Marissa watched from inside the doorless fridge, utterly awestruck at the woman who'd come to her rescue, fearlessly battling with the faceless staff. She spun her club, made from the broken leg of a Jokmok table and a Legio wall-mounted light. All its bulbs shattered to inflict some nasty wounds on whatever she hit with it. She effortlessly swiped it upwards, making a visceral crunch as it connected with the underside of the staff member's head as it connected, sending the creature toppling over, dead. Time seemed to move at a delay as Marissa looked at her savior 
as if she was seeing her through the lens of a slow-motion Hollywood movie cliché. Dirty red hair flew wildly around the woman as she turned and looked at her, the fierceness of her expression almost stopping Marissa's heart as their eyes met for the briefest of seconds. The woman was standing full of fire and confidence, Marissa cowering in a refrigerator, scared for her life. It was a moment that couldn't have lasted more than three seconds, but in the year that followed, Marissa would remember it as the moment, the day she and Hannah had met. They met properly the following day. More of the party that Hannah had been out with, looking for lost newcomers, had made sure Marissa was alright and guided her past an aisle of lamps, through a weird display section full of beds that were all small squares, turning left at a giant hot dog sign, before they arrived at their settlement, Market Hall. In the sea of endless showrooms and flat-packed furniture, she was amazed to see that not only were there other people here, but they had repurposed all the IKEA products around them into a makeshift encampment, with a barricade of chairs, tables, and all manner of furniture around them to keep the staff out. Marissa had never bought into the idea of love at first sight. She wrote off that kind of spark as an overly romanticized idea, made up to get people to hold on to unrealistic standards for falling in love. But seeing Hannah and getting to introduce herself the next day, she realized quickly that she'd been wrong, and Hannah had felt it just as instantly. The two fell head over heels for each other. As much as learning to live inside an infinite Ikea with no way out was an adjustment, Marissa was glad to have had Hannah. So a year after she had arrived, she decided to get her a clock. It might have seemed silly to get someone a gift in a place where everything around was free for the taking, but Marissa had been mulling over the idea for a while. Hannah was always complaining that she could never tell what time it was, especially when it was night and the lights of the store had gone out. Marissa always followed up by jokingly saying that Hannah's timing had been impeccable when she saved her from that staff member, but that had given her the idea. Sure, it was a little cheesy, maybe even over the top, but there was really a limit to how romantic either of them could be when trapped together in endless Ikea. Besides, compared to some Bandrom heart-decorated duvet covers, getting her a clock seemed to be a more symbolic, meaningful gesture. So Marissa headed off into the Ikea to retrieve a chala for Hannah. Having given the staff members the slip, she clambered down from atop the tall shelves. She hadn't stayed as close to the town of Market Hall as she usually would, but she was at least familiar enough with the area as she was in to find her way back. And thanks to the chala in her hands, she knew she had plenty of time before the lights went out again. Before long, Marissa started to see landmarks that had become so familiar to her over the course of the past year. The lights aisle, the square beds display, the hot dog sign, then she stopped in her tracks seeing something she hadn't seen since she arrived. It was the exit right in front of her. Gathered around the fire at night, they'd all shared the stories. Sometimes the exit to the store appeared in front of people, and they could escape the Ikea. Other times it just vanished before them, like a mirage in the desert. Hannah had once asked Marissa if she'd ever leave if she saw the exit. She replied, saying she had everything she needed right here. Her legs were moving without her even thinking about it. Marissa was sprinting towards the doors, still holding the chala in both hands as she ran. It was on sight. She hadn't even made the conscious choice to move towards the exit, and she couldn't stop herself now that she started. Within seconds, she made it to the doors and passed through them, the dim light of the overcast sky searing her eyes as she stepped outside. Then, the realization hit her, catching up to her like it had been a staff member chasing her. Hannah was still inside. Regret hadn't yet started to form. Marissa still thought she could go back and find her, and bring her back to the exit before it disappeared again. She turned to head back in, but it was already too late. Weeping, Marissa fell to her knees, having traded one hell for another. The clock in her hands vanished, fading from existence in time with the ticking of its second hand. The chala was gone, and Marissa would never see Hannah again.
On March 15, 2011, Martin Sims was wandering down the streets of Carson, California. His clothes were ragged, he was filthy and gibbering like a madman with a full beard and long, unkempt hair. His body was covered in scars, but he showed no signs of malnutrition. What made Martin's sudden appearance so remarkable? He'd been missing for three years. When he was interviewed by police, they asked him where he'd been all this time. They couldn't believe his answer. He'd been trapped in an IKEA since 2008, but this was no ordinary IKEA. This was a dangerous anomaly that would come to be known as SCP-3008. Martin's strange answers in his interview were laughed off by his interviewing officers, who assumed he was either crazy or under the influence of something, but they caught the attention of an SCP Foundation field agent embedded in the precinct. The report was passed up the chain to a local site director who approved a detachment of Foundation field operatives to look into Martin's case. While he was reluctant to lead the Foundation agents back to the offending IKEA, the Foundation can be extremely persuasive. His screams of, please, I'm begging you, don't take me back, don't make me go back, were noted but ultimately disregarded. When the SCP Foundation had triangulated the position of SCP-3008, which was indeed an active IKEA, the entire retail zone was closed and barricaded under the pretense of a severe black mold infestation. Armed Foundation personnel also arrived on the site shortly after, based on Martin's vague statements that there were creatures of some kind inside. Due to his deteriorating mental health, Martin was unable to provide a great deal of lucid information on the specific traits of SCP-3008, but one phrase he kept repeating was, bigger on the inside. Once researchers were satisfied that Martin had delivered all the pertinent information he was able to, he was administered foundation amnestics to erase his memory of the last three years and return to his family. A cover story was formulated. Martin had been kidnapped and abused for three years by a mentally unbalanced stalker in downtown Carson. He'd been able to escape as said stalker took his own life out of guilt, a suicide that the Foundation expertly fabricated to make their cover story airtight. With the loose end of Martin Sims taken care of, the true observation of SCP-3008 could begin. A base set around the perimeter of the mysterious IKEA kept a 24-hour watch on the building, covering all potential entrances and exits. No exploratory missions had yet been approved by the Foundation Ethics Committee, so they first wanted to perform a week of external observation to see if any of the store's anomalous properties extended beyond the confines of the building. After a week of nothing, it appeared they did not. A local site director approved of the use of 20 disposable Class D personnel to explore the interior of SCP-3008. The D-Class operatives would be split into four squads of five men, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta Squad. Each would be assigned a different quadrant of the store and would deliver information back to the control team on site via a live audio and video link. Three of the four teams upon entering the store reported nothing out of the ordinary. Neither the audio or video they were sending back indicated anything different from a standard IKEA store, from the flat pack wardrobes to the Swedish meatballs. Team Delta, however, suddenly began experiencing a scrambled audio and video connection. Shortly after, communication with Team Delta dropped off entirely. They disappeared somewhere inside the store and haven't been seen since, with one notable exception. After the disappearance and the extraction of teams, Foundation researchers classified SCP-3008 as Euclid because its anomalous properties were at least confined to the interior of the store, and even then seemingly not the entire interior. The anomalous area within SCP-3008 became known as SCP-3008-1, and containment appeared to be 100% secure. There was no telling how many people had already gone missing in the store over the years, but the disappearances must be stopped. The Foundation maintained constant surveillance around the perimeter of SCP-3008, but it appeared they could prevent any further incidents by simply preventing other civilians from accessing the IKEA store. Martin's ravings about monsters were assumed to just be the product of delirium, until a surviving member of Delta Team suddenly reappeared. The date was November 3, 2011. It was a cold night, a few hours after what would have been closing time if the store were still active and seven months after the extraction teams had disappeared somewhere in the confines of SCP-3008. There had been no anomalous activity outside the store since the perimeter was first secured, and the Foundation researchers hadn't expected that to change, until the last surviving member of Delta Team came barging out of the store's entrance. Startled field operatives were amazed to see him again, but they were even more amazed to see what was following him out of the store, repeating the same phrase, the store is now closed, please exit the building. Despite the fact that the entity chasing the Delta Team survivor was wearing the yellow shirt and blue pants of an IKEA store employee, the being definitely was not human. 
It was around 7 feet tall with no visible face. The entity had grossly extended limbs, with each arm being around 5 or 6 feet long and ending in a huge oversized hand. The whole process was so sudden that the field agents present at the perimeter weren't able to save the Delta Team survivor as the entity reached forward with his freakishly long arms, grabbed him and twisted his head off like a child with a doll. The field operatives present drew their weapons and peppered the entity with bullets. It would later be classified as SCP-3008-2. The being appeared to collapse and die from the physical trauma, at which point it and the body of the former Delta Team survivor were taken for an autopsy by Foundation researchers. There were no biological abnormalities of the body of the Delta the team survivor, so it did not appear that the anomalous properties of SCP-3008-1 had any effect on the physiology of its occupants. He was not malnourished despite being missing for months, and the contents of his stomach looked to be half-digested food consistent with the menu of a typical IKEA store restaurant. SCP-3008-2, on the other hand, raised a number of perplexing biological questions. The autopsy revealed that the creature's clothes were actually part of its body, like an additional layer of skin. The creature lacked blood or any kind of vascular system. Even stranger, the entity didn't appear to have bones or internal organs, not even a brain or nervous system. It was a being made entirely of skin all the way to its core. How it was able to move, or even live for that matter, remains a mystery. Though when you work for the SCP Foundation, you learn to accept that some things will always remain unexplained. One thing was certain though, Martin Sims was right about his monsters. After the incident with the Delta Team, the Foundation deemed that sending manned explorations into the heart of SCP-3008 was too much of a liability and planned a series of drone-based reconnaissance missions into the anomaly. The first of these drones experienced connection issues and failed when attempting to venture into the IKEA's anomalous zone. However, However, after a lengthy period of trial and error, the Foundation was able to establish a more secure connection with its drones, even when deep into the SCP-3008-1 anomalous zone. It was only then that some of the most extraordinary discoveries were made. SCP-3008-1 seemed to break the laws of spatial reality, as the area of the IKEA's interior was at least an order of magnitude larger than its exterior. Just as Martin Sims had said, it was bigger on the inside, but just how much bigger? The Foundation has yet to find evidence of any physical term within the store that might indicate SCP-3008-1 has an end point, while an area of at least 10 kilometers squared has been uncovered in SCP-3008-1. It could, in theory, be infinite. Laser rangefinder tests, which are normally very reliable, have only given inconclusive results. Interestingly, the anomalous area doesn't have any clear visual differences from the rest of the IKEA store, except that it extends forever. An individual trapped within the confines of SCP-3008-1 wouldn't even realize they've entered an anomalous zone until they tried to locate an exit and leave, at which point they'd find they were already hopelessly lost. The geography of SCP-3008-1 does at least appear to be consistent, so people trapped within are theoretically able to retrace their steps and escape if they haven't already ventured to too deep. According to data collected during the drone reconnaissance missions, SCP-3008-2, of which there appear to be a vast population, would wander the stores aimlessly during the day. They are unresponsive to the drone's presence and did not appear to be aggressive. While the physical descriptions of these creatures could vary slightly, they all follow the same overall trend. Clothes, consistent with an IKEA uniform, no face, either seemingly too tall or too short, and limbs that are grossly out of proportion with their bodies. As the Foundation began sending drones deeper and SCP-3008-1, they found another incredible discovery. There was an unknown population of humans trapped inside IKEA's anomalous zone, and these people had used the IKEA furniture around them to create entire settlements and towns within the store. There were several of these towns, all of which seemed to cohabitate peacefully. Even Foundation personnel found this development in their research to be truly extraordinary. Since SCP-3008 was first identified, there have been only 14 civilian escapes. Some had been trapped inside for months, others had been in there for years, some far longer than Martin's three-year stint. While every one of these escapees has eventually been released back to their home, after a liberal application of amnestics and a proper cover story has been devised, the Foundation interviewed each of them extensively first. According to each of these escapees, the people trapped inside the IKEA have built an entirely new society across the various settlements. Contrary to the Lord of the Flies' expectations of a group of people isolated and afraid, there is immense cooperation between the trapped civilians. 
The food in the several IKEA restaurants in SCP-3008-1 mysteriously replenishes while nobody's there, so there's no threat of starving, and the automatic turning on and off of the lights forms as a rudimentary kind of day and night cycle. Nighttime, however, is when things get dangerous, as the SCP-3008-2 entities, which are known to the people inside as the staff, become extremely hostile after dark. Aggressive hordes of the staff swarm the settlements at night, repeating, this door is now closed, please exit the building. The civilians inside are usually able to repel these attacks with minimal casualties, but the constant war of attrition slowly wears down those inside. The bodies of the creatures also need to be removed from the area after each attack, as the presence of corpses or even parts of corpses has been known to heighten the ferocity of the next night's attack. During the day, the staff return to a docile and unresponsive state, though they'll still defend themselves violently if anyone dares to attack. Over the course of the interviews with the 14 escapees, Foundation researchers were able to answer another of their key questions. How had so many people gone missing in the store for so long without being noticed? But the answer they received only raised many more unsettling queries. According to the escapees, there were people inside the settlements that, despite being otherwise of entirely sound mind and standard intelligence, seemed to lack very common knowledge that even a child should know. For example, some of them weren't aware of the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, or stranger still, the existence of the Statue of Liberty. This led the researchers to a frightening conclusion. SCP-3008-1 may not only be a nexus point of multiple IKEA stores in our dimension, it could be connected to IKEAs in every dimension where IKEAs exist. While it only abducts a handful of people from each store over an extended period of time, it suddenly becomes clear how this SCP was able to trap so many people without detection over such a long period of time, which in turn led to an even more terrifying revelation. The SCP Foundation may not have SCP-3008-1 as contained as they thought. It might even be tucked away in an IKEA store somewhere near you, just waiting for you to visit. After all, there's always room for one more. It had happened again. Some absolute schmuck of a junior researcher had left a certain door ajar. The door that kept SCP-049 the Plague Doctor locked in his containment chamber. As a result, the good doctor had wandered out, and given the junior researcher a hug of appreciation for freeing him, leaving his dead body sprawled out across the ground. Typical, a problem solving itself. But this time, the problem had been a little more severe than just the one responsible facing immediate consequences of their actions. The Plague Doctor had grabbed the junior researcher's corpse and dragged him back into his cell, leaving the door once again slightly ajar. With a variety of equipment from his magical medical bag, the doctor had transformed the junior researcher's corpse into a disfigured zombie, in hopes of curing him of the pestilence and released him into the facility. 049 had followed him out to observe his behavior, and in the process he'd given several guards and members of janitorial staff a congratulatory hand touch, sending them to early graves. By the time people realized what was going on, six people were dead, several zombies were wandering around the building, and 049 was spotted in a lab stealing medical equipment. Dr. Clef, who was on duty at the time, was getting sick of this nonsense. This was actually the third breach that the Plague Doctor had been involved in this month, and it was only the 14th. He was frankly ready to wash his hands of this particular anomaly, because it wasn't just the fact that the Plague Doctor killed people that bothered Dr. Clef. After all, Dr. Clef himself had killed a considerable number of people. It was the fact that the Plague Doctor was also so damn sanctimonious about it. Clef breathed a sigh and rubbed his temples to subdue the incoming headache. It was time to have a little tribunal and decide what disciplinary action he would take against this freaky physician. The Plague Doctor was on his knees, locked into place by heavy chains and restraints around his neck, arms, and legs. These weren't even official Foundation property. Dr. Clef had brought them in from his private leisure room back at his house. Oof. As usual, the doctor was preaching the immense value of his work. The pestilence runs rife, Dr. Clef. Surely you must see that, the doctor cried. You're a man of science yourself, allegedly. Surely you can empathize with my mission. I just want to help people. Can't you see? I'm just like you. Blah, blah, blah. Always this goddamn pestilence. Do you ever turn off? Clef said, waving away the doctor's words. I don't know about your pestilence, but I'm definitely looking at a pest right now. What the hell am I supposed to do with you? No matter what allowances we give you, you just keep escaping. The doctor hung his head. He hated when people treated him like this, like some wild animal. Of course, occasionally people died, but it was only in the pursuit of saving so many more lives. 
He tried to convince Dr. Clef that the costs would pale in the face of the rewards, but the gung-ho Foundation researcher simply wasn't interested in hearing it. Instead, he was brewing up a new idea, one that might rid him of the Plague Doctor forever, even without breaking the Foundation's goofy rule against killing anomalies. You know what, Dr. Clef said, affecting a voice of mock kindness. You finally got your words through my thick head. I get it now. I get how important your research is. All this time we've been stepping in the way of Nobel Prize winning work. I don't know how I'll ever live with myself for this. I just want to say personally on behalf of the SCP Foundation, we are truly sorry. Suddenly, the Plague Doctor perked up. My goodness, he thought. I've finally gotten through. He was practically vibrating with glee. Your apology is accepted, good sir, the Plague Doctor proclaimed. Let us not obsess over the past. We will look towards the future. Exactly, Dr. Clef cut in. That's why, by way of an apology, I plan to reassign you to a special research facility where you get to run the show. You'll have live test subjects aplenty and no accountability to the Foundation whatsoever. How does that sound to you, Doc? The Plague Doctor somehow rose to his feet despite the chains, perhaps propelled by the sheer force of his love for science. I suggest we leave at once, he said. Thank you, Dr. Clef, you kind, kind man. I always knew that you were the reasonable one. Even Dr. Clef had to resist the urge to laugh about that one. Smash cut to the next day, when Dr. Clef, the Plague Doctor, and a group of mobile task force officers were crowded into a helicopter heading towards SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. Of course, the Plague Doctor didn't know that. He thought he was heading towards the state-of-the-art research facility that Dr. Clef promised him. Clef, on the inside, reasoned that what this bird brain moron didn't know wouldn't hurt him. The helicopter landed within the perimeter established around the abandoned Ikea, and the Plague Doctor was herded off the vehicle. He'd bought Clef's lie, hook, line, and sinker, and as such was unusually cooperative with the guards. Dr. Clef pointed to the building and instructed the Plague Doctor to head inside and just keep walking. He'd find the test subjects and the facility soon enough, and why would the Foundation be lying to him? They'd even let him take his medical bag in there. When you get in there, ask for Hugh. He'll be your lead assistant, Dr. Clef told him. Lead assistant? You mean to tell me I will have multiple research assistants? The plague doctor said, Oh, splendid. I cannot wait to meet this Hugh. Oh, yeah, Dr. Clef said, biting his bottom lift to stifle a laugh. His name's Jazz. Be sure to mention that. It'll help speed along the process. The plague doctor nodded his head in thanks. Much appreciated, Dr. Clef. Rest assured I will not forget this kindness. As the Plague Doctor wandered into the abandoned store, his heart swelling with pride, Dr. Clef began to quietly laugh behind his back like the big old jerk face he was. When he could no longer see the Plague Doctor, Clef turned to one of his colleagues and jokingly asked, Does that mean we'll need to reclassify 3008 as Thaumiel now? Not looking forward to that paperwork. On the inside of the infinite Ikea, the Plague Doctor was chuckling to himself with glee. After all these years of hard work, his merit had been recognized, and he'd been given the respect he deserved from his peers at the Foundation. He was so wrapped up in his own sense of personal pride that he didn't even register it as strange that he was surrounded by odd, sterile living rooms, bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens, all in a seemingly random configuration with signs next to them in a mix of the King's English and what he believed to be some form of Swedish that he didn't quite understand. Still, he didn't mind too much. He just assumed that these must be the accommodations for himself, his patients, his test subjects, and his research assistants, and to think they'd built this whole place just for him and his research. It lifted his soul to know that the SCP Foundation had finally recognized the pestilence for the danger that it is. From now on, everything would change. He'd probably find the cure in the next few years. Then, it suddenly occurred to him, he was a little lost. The layout of the research laboratory was incredibly strange. It seemed like an utterly arbitrary configuration of bizarre rooms, separated by wide aisles. It didn't seem sanitary at all. Where were the sealed laboratories, the gurneys, the patient beds, the medical equipment? And on top of all that, where was Hugh? Some kind of shenanigans were afoot. That much was clear now. The Plague Doctor quickened his pace through the halls of this strange building. One way or another, he would get to the bottom of this. Nothing would get in the way of the important research he planned to conduct here. After what felt like hours of aimless walking, the Plague Doctor encountered some other sentient beings, a group of three people wearing ragged, post-apocalyptic-looking clothes, all carrying defensive kitchen knives and hammers. 
The doctor was overjoyed to see these people he could actually converse with. The others, upon seeing him, were a little taken aback. Had some Renfair cosplayer somehow accidentally wandered into the building? What on earth was going on here? Excuse me, good sirs, the plague doctor called out. I'm searching for a Hugh Jazz. That caused the group to break into laughter, immediately lessening the tension. The de facto leader of the group, Calvin, replied, Aren't we all? 049 didn't get it. But these humans, nonetheless, liked the cut of this new guy's jib. All three of them had been in here for at least a year each, and it had been a while since they had a good laugh in this terrible labyrinthian place. Calvin stepped forward, lowering his weapons now that he could see that this weird cosplayer guy didn't seem like a threat. He cleared his throat and asked, Mind if I ask who you are, fella? The plague doctor was taken aback by this question. Did they not prepare you in advance for my arrival? The group shook their heads. How strange, the plague doctor said. Well, I suppose some proper introductions are in order then. I am your new leader, as appointed by Dr. Clef of the SCP Foundation. I'm a reasonable man, a man of science, and under my leadership, we will be a scientific force the likes of which the world has never seen. Together we will cure the pestilence and save all of mankind. There was a long pause after that. None of the group of humans really knew how to react to this. Calvin thought to himself, great, we got ourselves a major space case. Let's get him back to the camp before he gets himself killed. He forced a smile and nodded, pretending to be impressed by the plague doctor's bizarre ranting. Well then, doctor, he said, we better get you back to our camp. We're not gonna get anything done while we're just standing around, will we? The plague doctor couldn't agree more. He followed the group of his three new research assistants further into this incredibly strange scientific building. The plague doctor indeed appreciated Dr. Clef putting all this together for him, but he would privately indulge in the thought that Dr. Clef seemingly could not put together a laboratory to save his life. This place was a bizarre, confusing disaster, but he would still make it work one way or another. However, his musings were interrupted when the lights went out. The three people with him began gasping in shock and horror. Calvin was repeating to himself, No, this is impossible. I timed it. I swear I timed it. But the plague doctor found their attitude to be utterly baffling. These were supposedly to be intrepid men of science, and yet they were afraid of the dark. It seemed they really did need his leadership to get anything done here. Follow me, gentlemen, the plague doctor said. It's merely a failure of the lights. I'll get this rubbish sorted out. He began to walk forward as the three human beings began to panic behind him, telling him that if he keeps walking, he'll die. He needs to come back. They need to stick together. But he kept walking. He didn't get this far by being a coward, after all. At least the others are following him now, wielding their hammers and kitchen knives. He'd whip them into shape. Then his attention was stolen by something altogether stranger. It was a creature, humanoid but not human, standing about ten feet away from him, seemingly ignorant to his presence. The Plank Doctor was simultaneously fascinated and horrified by what he saw before him. It was in some kind of yellow and blue uniform, with a hideous, malformed, faceless head and two long, tangled arms that it dragged along the floor behind it like an orangutan. It was a truly repulsive, pitiful creature, one that made the plague doctor sad to even look at it. Clearly this had to be an advanced case of the pestilence. While the plague doctor was filled with scientific curiosity, his three human traveling companions were filled with terror. They were still so far away from the camp, and the staff had found them already? Because there's never just one. They're like big, deadly cockroaches. If you can see one, more are on the way. Their best bet is just staying incredibly quiet and trying to sneak past. Hello there, you poor fellow, the plague doctor said, stepping forwards and waving. It seems you're in dire need of some medical assistance. Calvin and his two companions were mortified. So this was how they were going to die? After making the mistake of being kind to a clearly deranged man dressed as a medieval plague doctor? What a way to go. The second it heard the plague doctor's voice, the member of staff was activated, as were several others in a 10 meter radius. They all suddenly stood upright, muscles taut with violence waiting to happen. They began chanting their dreaded phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. While converging and running towards the plague doctor like a pack of hungry dogs, it was a terrifying sight to behold. But not for the plague doctor himself. There were so many of these poor infected people, and clearly the pestilence had not only warped their bodies but broken their minds. After all, this wasn't a store. This was the new research center specifically designed for his research. Dr. Clef would surely never just lie about something like that. He was an honorable man, 
Then again, maybe that was exactly why Clef had sent him here. So many victims of advanced pestilence would make perfect test subjects, a paradise of research. The plague doctor couldn't be happier, as a group of ten staff members converged on him. Calvin and his men could barely look. The new guy may have been crazy, but he didn't deserve to go out like this. However, the last thing they expected was for the plague doctor to calmly raise his hands, allowing the members of staff to run right into his deadly touch. In the following moments, all ten of them were lying on the ground, dead. The three men were utterly speechless. What had just happened? Had the man in the strange costume snuck in a secret knife or a silenced gun? Had he gone into some hyper-advanced instant-kill kung fu move that was simply too fast and subtle for them to perceive? Or had he really just killed ten members of staff in mere seconds just by touching them? The plague doctor turned to them and said, Well then, gentlemen, let us not dilly-dally. Grab one each and we'll carry them to the laboratory on the double. Soon after, the plague doctor and his three research assistants arrived at a nearby encampment. Several other members of staff had attacked them on the way, but a single touch from the plague doctor had killed each one. The human's perspective on this mysterious stranger had changed entirely. He'd gone from a goofy crank to a godlike savior. For as long as they'd been in here, they'd lived in terror of staff, but they were nothing to this man. With a single touch from him, they were gone forever. As the doors of the camp were closed behind him, the people of the camp began running towards them, confused and curious. The plague doctor was delighted to see that there were so many other research assistants here to help him on his divine mission. Dr. Clef, that beautiful, sweet man, had given him such a boon. Perhaps now, the pestilence may finally be cured. One of the camp leaders ran over furious and yelled, What the hell are you doing? You know you can't just bring those bodies in here. It'll only attract more of them, you fool. Fool. The plague doctor found this rather rude, but he'd overlook it for the sake of the greater good. He'd spent his whole life dealing with the aspirations from lesser intellects who couldn't even begin to understand his work. The masses rarely understand processes, only results. And here he knew he would be able to give them results. Worry not, good sir. I am a medical man, the plague doctor said, simply walking past the naysayer and bidding his first three research assistants to drag the bodies after him. I will bring this place up to code. You will see soon enough that my scientific leadership is second to none. Now I will retire to my office and begin dissecting these samples. Before the camp leader could say anything else, the plague doctor had retired into a staff room, which had been retrofitted as a kind of headquarters for members of the camp. That's when Calvin approached the camp leader and told him the astonishing news. Look, boss, I know he looks like a goofball in a Halloween costume, he said, but this guy, he's special, he's something else, he can kill the staff. The camp leader scoffed. <laughs> so can we, he said. Calvin shook his head. No, you don't get it, boss, not like us. This guy, he can kill the staff just by touching them. And the camp leader had no response to that. In his new study, the plague doctor was dissecting one of the dead staff members and was astonished to see what was happening within. The creature had no organs. It was simply that strange, slightly yellow tissue all the way down. He'd never seen the pestilence have such a profound and horrific effect on its victims. It had horribly altered them, all the way to the core. Was this what the Great Dying was truly capable of in its later stages? The plague doctor shuddered, both with horror and scientific excitement. He'd barely been here a day, and he'd made some of the most incredible discoveries. He took fastidious notes on these new revelations, feeling the picture coming together in his mind. His deep scientific thoughts were interrupted by the door opening, and Calvin and the camp leader stepped in. The camp leader was different than before. He had none of the bluster and arrogance of his first words. He showed fealty, like he was standing in the presence of a divine being. I I'd like to formally welcome you to our camp, Doctor, the camp leader said. We're extremely fortunate to have you here. Please, if you need anything, don't hesitate to let us know. We are truly at your service. The plague doctor was delighted to hear this. With a polite nod, he replied, More test subjects like these will do just fine, good sir. I believe I am very close to a breakthrough here. I've always hated shopping for furniture. Grocery shopping? They've got cake, cheese, and beer. Sounds perfect to me. Clothes shopping? Sure, I'll pick up some new jeans. That's a fine Saturday afternoon. But shopping for household items, pushing through the crowds of broke college students and bickering couples on the hunt for coffee tables and TV stands, all 20-page instruction books, a dozen wooden puzzle pieces, and tiny little screws that disappear into your carpet the second you take them out of the package, that's my own personal hell. 
So when my wife Brenda, the love of my life, my light in the darkest of times, asked me to go to Ikea with her to pick up the Glossstad sofa she found online, plus a few other essentials for the new house, I was reluctant to say the least. But love won out, and I just couldn't say no to those eyes. Or the promise that we'd pick up my favorite takeout on the way home. It would be a quick trip. We run in, we grab the sofa, and maybe a high-list shelving unit for her office, and we head back out. One hour tops. Well, some mad god of chaos and cheap furniture must have turned his hateful eye on me. I've been walking for hours, and nothing has changed. I knew Ikea was big, but this seems impossible. It's like the store never ends. I kept calling out her name, Brenda, but there's no response. Just my own voice bouncing off the flat white surface and rows of muskin wardrobes. I was such a jerk, I always do that, get swept up in the stress when we go furniture shopping. I told myself I wouldn't do it this time, but like clockwork, I got overwhelmed by the vast aisles, the myriad of options, and the hard to pronounce names. I was impatient. I told her to go look at throw pillows on her own because I was sick of getting sidetracked. She loved throw pillows. No, no, I, I can't let myself do that, it hasn't been that long. She's gotta be here somewhere. I, I can't let the last time we spoke be a fight about living room decor. Day two. So, it's my second day lost in Ikea. I can't believe I just wrote that. Also, I'm not entirely sure how many days it's been. There's no windows here. I, I can see when the sun's up and when it's down. The lights turn off sometimes, and I think that's meant to indicate night, but I really can't be sure. The clock on my phone is stuck at 3.22 p.m., the exact time we entered the store. I guess I should say I've slept once since being here. Managed to camp out on a Jisheim futon mattress. It wasn't the most comfortable, but I've definitely had worse. This place reminds me of the island of the Lotus Eaters in the Odyssey. I can't tell how much time is passing. Days and nights don't really exist here. Speaking of eating, I wish I had some food right about now. Brenda always has granola bars in her purse, and she's ready for anything. I've always admired that about her. I had a piece of gum in my pocket, but I think it lost its flavor ages ago. Nothing to eat, no one to talk to. I haven't seen an employee, another customer, not a single living soul. I don't have any signal, but my phone still has battery, and my step counter app says I've walked 30 miles. 30. Miles. And still not one friendly face, no exit sign. I just had the most horrible thought as I sit here on this pile of stunts and scribbling in this notebook. What if I'm dead? What if I died on the store floor, keeled over from a heart attack or a stroke or something, and this is my eternal resting place? I, I know I wasn't perfect. I, I could have done more charity work, volunteered at soup kitchens, and helped more old ladies cross the street, but I didn't think I'd wind up in hell. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once wrote, Hell is other people, but I'd like to respectfully disagree with Monsieur Sartre. Hell is an endless vacant Ikea. Day three. So it turns out I am not alone here. Not exactly. I still haven't seen another human being, but I did see something else. While I was trying to sleep, nestled in a makeshift bed of Shardar cushion covers and kept awake by the gnawing growl of my empty stomach, I heard a shuffling sound several feet away. Footsteps. I sat up, eyes darting around for the source of the sound. Could it be Brenda? Or some other hapless soul sucked into this prison with me? I spotted the silhouette of a person wearing an IKEA employee uniform, that unmistakable bright yellow shirt, a beacon of hope. Then it turned around, and I realized this was no ordinary salesperson. Their face was smooth, featureless, like an egg. If an egg was the size of a human head and perched on top of a seven-foot frame. Once I noticed its face, or lack thereof, I took in the rest of the creature's nightmarish form. Its proportions were all off. Short, stubby legs beneath a distended torso that stretched into long, long arms that dragged along the ground as it walked. Its hands were massive, with tapered fingers perfect for grabbing anyone who gets too close. Well, there was no way in hell I was falling asleep with that thing roaming around. So I got moving, and I tried to sneak my way past it. I thought it was clear when suddenly... Excuse me, sir. A voice came from the direction of the monster, even though it had no mouth to speak with. The store is closed. You need to vacate the premises. It spoke in a pleasant tone. Polite. A true customer service voice. But when I turned, it was ripping its way through the maze of furniture toward me like it wanted to tear me limb from limb. 
I, I haven't done much running since my high school track and field days, but I turned and booked it as fast as I could. It didn't matter that it was dark. It didn't matter that I could trip at any second and land face first on a lamp or a sharp corner of a table. I had to get as far away from that thing as possible before I found out firsthand what exactly it did to trespassers. But my stamina isn't what it used to be, and I could feel exhaustion catching up to me. I could hear the thundering of the creature's footsteps as it gave chase, and I knew my heart couldn't keep this up much longer. So I did what I used to do when I was a kid and the big neighbor boys tried to beat the crap out of me on my walk home. I hid. I yanked open the doors to a wardrobe and I stuffed myself in, holding the doors closed from the inside. I could hear a scrabbling sound against the door, the scraping and scratching of the staff monster trying to get at me through the wood. But thank the Swedes for their fine engineering, because that wood just would not give. After what felt like an eternity, the assault on the door stopped, and I could hear the creature shuffling away, off to another section of the massive store. I stayed there in the pitch dark for a long time, slowing my breathing down and trying to get my heart to climb back down from my throat. What was that thing? Did it live here? Where did its voice come from? How did it know I was here? The questions bounced around my mind and I knew I might never find the answers. I'd guessed before that this was no ordinary Ikea. The endless rows of aisles and total lack of any human beings had been a pretty good clue. But now I knew for sure. I had left my own world behind. As I drifted off to sleep, the wardrobe closing around me like a coffin, my drifting consciousness thoughts were of Brenda. Whether she was trapped in here too, and on the off chance she was, if those creatures would get to her before I could. After the lights turned back on and a new day began, I started my walk in search of one thing only, food. I'd felt the hunger getting to me before, but after my sprint away from the faceless monster, my body was nearly limp with exhaustion. I had to get some calories in me as soon as possible, or I might not have the strength to run for my life next time. It took a few hours of walking, but I eventually spotted what I was looking for. There's only one thing I've ever enjoyed about Ikea, and it's those beautiful little meatballs. As I rounded a corner past a stack of Van Slang plant stands, the heavenly aroma hit me, like the most welcome slap to the face in the world. There in front of me, bathed in the warm glow of the fluorescent lights, was the store restaurant, and in the center, a trough of meatballs. I could see the steam rising up from the little jewels of meat. I didn't care there was no chef present or anyone who could have made them. I ran to the food and I stuffed my face. Once my stomach was full of meatballs and my heart full of new hope, I examined my surroundings. There were snacks, Swedish snacks I could bring with me. I grabbed a clam bee canvas bag and began to fill it with whatever I could grab. Cans of cider, jars of lingonberry jam and mustard, boxes of muesli, and bags of sour candy. Hell, I even grabbed some of the salty licorice. When food is this scarce, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, even when its breath absolutely reeks. I'm not too sure where I'll sleep tonight. Don't want to be out in the open in case more of the staff find me. I try not to think too long about what might happen if they catch me next time. Maybe this is crazy, but I think I'll build a fort. I've got plenty of space for it and plenty of materials. I'll climb up to the top of a tall shelf and build a fort up there. Just have to hope I don't toss and turn too much in my sleep, or I might impale myself on the Targar floor lamp. Day 4. Something incredible happened. I built my fort pretty close to the food area so I'd be able to access it again when I woke up. When the lights came on this morning, I saw someone helping themselves to the meatballs. They couldn't be staff because they've got nowhere to put the food even if they did. I took a closer look, and it was a person. An actual human person. Blonde woman in a blue sweater, loading up a bag with meatballs and other supplies just like I had the previous day. Hey! Called out to her and my voice felt strange. Rusty from not talking to anyone for days, I guess. She spun around, brandishing a fire axe. Right, she probably thought I was a staff member preparing to attack. I waved my arms to draw attention to my face, its eyes, nose, and mouth to make it clear I wasn't one of them. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I'm human. Hello? Her posture relaxed and she motioned for me to come down and speak to her. She introduced herself as Gloria and explained that she was part of a community of other humans who had built a town in the checkout department. They had set up lights, beds, and most importantly, a gate to keep the staff out at night. How long have you been here? She asked me, as we made our way towards checkouts together. Um, four days, I think? Her eyes widened, impressed. Most people usually don't make it through that many nights alone in here. The staff gets to them first, 
I shuddered at her words, and my thoughts turned once again to Brenda. I asked Gloria if she'd seen my wife at all, if she'd made it to the checkouts before me. She shook her head sadly. I came in with my sister, she told me. I haven't seen her since. And how long have you been in here? I asked. Gloria sighed and patted me on the back before speaking again. About a year? We were silent the rest of the walk, and by the time we reached the gates of checkouts, the lights were turning off for the night. Quick, we need to get inside. Gloria ushered me through the gates and followed behind. I was about to question her urgency when suddenly two faceless horrors lurched from the shadows. These two staff members were smaller than the ones I'd seen before, maybe four feet tall. They had the same long arms though, and they were reaching for us as they ran at the gate with primal speed. They threw their bodies against it, arms stretched towards me and Gloria. I screamed, jumping back. Gloria just watched them, stone-faced, waiting to see if this would be the night they actually broke through. After a while, the staff gave up and stumbled away, and I turned to take in the town of checkouts. I never thought I'd be so thrilled to see a collection of beds, lamps, and strangers. So many people, when I had worried I'd never seen another person again. There are around 40 people in total, though I haven't met everyone yet. Some folks were already sleeping when I got there, or keeping to themselves. The people I did meet nearly knocked me out with their kindness. They fed me, gave me water, a bed to sleep in, and a set of clean clothes one of them had fashioned out of sheets. They're not exactly stylish, but I'd take anything over the t-shirt and slacks I'd been sleeping and sweating in for days. I think I could be okay here, at least for a little while. At the very least, I'll get a good night's sleep for once. Day 11. So, I've been here at the checkouts for about a week now, and as bizarre as it feels to say this, I think I'm starting to settle in. Being around other people keeps me sane. Without that endless stretch of silence, there's less space for my mind to wander to the worst possibilities. John, one of the men here, had a phone charger with him and I was able to get mine juiced up again. There's still no signal, but I had a few movies saved, and plenty of podcasts. I've been listening to a true crime show with some of the other people here, distracting ourselves from our own horror with the tale of somebody else's. We gather around, break into the rations we gather during the day, and even crack open some of the cider, while we listen to the silky voice narrator to take us through the story of bloody murder in a small town. It's kind of like summer camp, you know, without the nature, or the camp counselors, or the possibility of it ever ending. I've been asking around about Brenda, describing her, seeing if anyone spotted her, dead or alive. No one has. Gloria said that maybe Brenda never made it to where we are. Maybe she found the exit a long time ago and she's somewhere in the real world waiting for me to come back. That's what she thinks happened to her sister. It's coming up on the one year anniversary of her getting trapped inside, and she told me a secret. She's planning to try and escape. She spotted exit signs before and tracked them across the store. They seem to move around, though, shifting from one place to another when no one is watching. But she's figured out a pattern, and she's going to put it to the test. She's leaving next week. She wanted to tell me. She's a nice lady. I hope she makes it. Day 18. I woke up to the sounds of screaming. I rushed to the gate to see what was going on, and I saw John walking back from his supply run, cradling something in his arms. I couldn't make it out, but it was limp pale and dripping red. As he got closer, I saw a head of blonde hair, and my stomach dropped. Gloria. She had snuck out while everyone was asleep, didn't want to say goodbyes, and tried to find her way out. The staff had found her first. She was dead by the time John spotted her lying on the ground, a crimson smear across the tile signaling where the staff had dragged her. They packed her up into a box as a kind of burial. We all said a few words, and then two of the men took the box away. They had to put it somewhere far from the town, before it started to smell. I, I can't sleep. I can't stop thinking about Gloria and what happened to her. She seemed so sure, so confident. I've been looking through her things, what she had left by her bed. There isn't much, but there's a notebook like mine. She wrote her plan in here. Everything she noticed about the exit signs, the staff's behavioral patterns. I know it didn't work out for her, but there's something here. No one's spotted Brenda yet. I don't think she's in here with me. I think somehow she got free. She's out there waiting for me. I, I can't spend one more night here. I won't. I'm gonna go for it. I'm finding the exit tonight. Whether that's the door out of this place or the sweet release of death, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Either way, I'll be out of this Scandinavian modernist hellhole once and for all. Hello, welcome to Ikea, where our motto is, you get what you pay for, and sometimes a little less. You may think the greatest frustration you'll receive from heading down to your local Ikea warehouse is spending a few hours walking around the Labyrinthian showroom, 
or maybe arguing with your partner in broken Swedish about the correct way to put together a Bjorksnas, or perhaps even needing to slide a piece of cardboard under the front left corner of your pack's wardrobe, because otherwise it'll wobble. But these are nothing compared to you getting trapped inside of SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. Not only can you spend so long in this eternal flat pack purgatory that your bones may turn to dust on the show floor, but the murderous staff, those are the malformed faceless weirdos in IKEA uniforms, will hunt you down and beat you to death for not leaving. And believe us, leaving is a whole lot harder than you'd like to think. That's why we put the question to you. How would you survive or even escape SCP-3008 The Infinite IKEA? And these are your best and most interesting answers. Connor Nolan said, with limitless refilling food and a vast expanse of IKEA toolkits and construction materials, the endless IKEA sounds like a pretty alright place to be stuck, all things considered. We love your positive attitude, Connor. Sometimes having a nice outlook on life can make any situation, even being stranded in a dimension full of affordable Swedish furniture, just that little bit nicer. However, if you want to survive, you're also going to need to be realistic. During the day, yes, the worst you'll have to deal with is getting lost. The risk of not having food and the existential horror of knowing you may draw your last breath inside an Ikea. But at night, the staff will actively hunt and try to kill you. And if you're not prepared, believe us, they will. So by all means, keep your optimism, but don't allow that sunny attitude to allow you to drop your guard, or the next set of meatballs might be made out of you. Purple Panda said, I would simply hide in one of the cabinets in the kitchen aisle for the night, then come out during the day for food and return back to my tiny lodge and then rinse and repeat until I die of old age. And for extra protection, I'd duct tape the inside of the cabinet door at night. It wouldn't be much different from my current life. Now that's a little more like it. It's not a bad idea to keep things simple when you're trapped inside SCP-3008, and making a cabinet your home is a good way to potentially avoid the wrath of the staff. However, getting a little bit of Connor's more hopeful mentality may also help. After all, why resign yourself to dying inside the IKEA when you can keep the fires of hope alive? Like the kind of flames produced by a lovely Sinlig scented candle, available at IKEA for $1.49. Dirt said, dig a hole. Just dig a giant tunnel system underground and put rugs over the entrances. Have tunnels going to sources of food, water, etc. Staff won't find you if you cover your entrances. You might say, however, where do we get digging tools? the garden section, or just make them. This would be a long project, so you would most likely have to stay in a small base until you dig enough. This idea is certainly ambitious. Your biggest problem is probably that the only digging equipment available in IKEA is the Grasmaro, a $4.99 set of three gardening tools, including a tiny hand shovel. Given that the actual layout of the IKEA appears unpredictable and ever-expanding, it would also be incredibly difficult to properly plan and create tunnels, even if you had decades to do it. Though, of course, maybe you're an expert tunneler. And if that's the case, we apologize sincerely for besmirching your honor. Llama fan said, I would make a wall of toilets and live off of crayons. We have good news and bad news. The good news is that IKEA stocks the Mala 12-piece crayon set, giving you a delicious variety of colors to try while trapped in the infinite IKEA. The bad news is that these crayons have pretty much no nutritional value, so your flushing fortress may actually become a porcelain prison as your body and mind slowly give out from a lack of sustenance. Getting bludgeoned to death by the staff inside of your toilet tower would probably be a mercy in the end. GW said, I would honestly stay if I got stuck there, with things like when day breaks over the horizon. Build a home on the steel supports overhead using a pull-up ladder to get up and down and live as comfortably as possible. This is certainly a valid point. A number of horrific XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios, like SCP-001, the dreaded When Day Breaks event, wouldn't actually affect the inside of the infinite IKEA, seeing as its lights function as a kind of internal sun. And if it's high enough above sea level, you wouldn't have to worry much about climate change either. The staff trying to beat you to death every night may put a damper on things, though. Sanic the Hedgehog said, I don't think the staff are faster than the speed of sound. That's true, Sanic, but there are also no chili dogs inside of the infinite IKEA, and that's no good. 
Kai Wilkie said, When it comes to daytime, I'd search for other survivors that are inside with me. I would work with them to build a civilization and live together. As it gets close to night, I'd search for food and supplies to keep us alive through the night. When it becomes morning, I'd clean up the bodies and search for more survivors. This is one of the most tried and true methods of long-term survival in the infinite Ikea. However, as you'll find with almost everything in life, it is easier said than done. Even some of the largest settlements inside 3008 have been destroyed by careless decisions. After all your months and years of hard work building up fortifications, gathering supplies, creating a new form of entertainment where you turn to Valjason toilet brushes into puppets that perform inside of a cardboard box, all of that effort can be lost in a split second when one person forgets to lock the Carlby countertop fence and staff members come flooding in. Hazel said, If they had a Wi-Fi connection and I had my phone, food, and a shower, I would be 100% fine. And maybe a TV? Good news! IKEA has Wi-Fi and food. Bad news. Unless you can, by some act of pure luck, find the staff quarters, there's unlikely to be a shower in the building. Not a working one, at least. The appliances in the bathroom section are not operational. And frankly, they should warn you of that to avoid embarrassing situations. But enough about why we're banned from the local IKEA, because there's more bad news. There are no TVs in IKEA, though you can get yourself a classy and tasteful Brimness TV stand, and simply imagine that the fake TV sitting on it is real. Or there's always the Devalja Sun toilet brush puppets. Mob Recon said, I would dress up as an IKEA employee, and when the staff try to attack me, I just claim to work there. We think your heart is in the right place, but considering the staff within 3008 don't look human at all, you'd probably need to go a little more extreme to convince them that you're one of them. Like Grayson K. Grayson K said, I remember from one video about SCP-3008 that the staff are completely empty. They have no organs at all, so what someone could do is just wear the hollowed out staff as a costume to move among other staff at night. See, that's dedicated to the performance. True, frightening dedication. Seeing that the staff aren't exactly crafty, this could actually work. However, if your disguise is good enough to fool other members of the staff, then there's a good chance that other survivors living in 3008 might think you're actually a member of the staff running around at night. And you may end up taking a Vorda chef's knife to the face. 999 in the kitchen section. Random user said, As soon as night comes, I'd simply lock myself in the nearest bathroom with some furniture and cry. Then when the morning comes, I'll get my daily rations and the cycle repeats. Not a bad idea. We personally use this method in our own lives every single day, and we're not even trapped in the infinite Ikea. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on. Sam Yates said, I'd build some sort of fortress out of big, thick rugs. The staff could attack and break the base made of wood, but you could easily punch your way through a rug? I don't know. Strangely, there's been very little research into that area, Sam. Perhaps rugs are the ultimate recipe for fortress structural integrity. Maybe all those kings and queens and dukes and counts were wrong and stone <laughs> castles weren't the answer. It was rugs the whole time. The problem is, if you're wrong and the staff gets in, it'll be the last mistake you ever made. As you die on a pile of Langstead and stage rum rugs. Pope Kool-Aid said, I'd do what any middle-class American would do in that situation. Get my gun. Sorry to tell you, Holy Father, but they don't sell guns in Ikea. Unless you like taking your gun to Ikea with you all the time just in case one of those shady, over fridges tries something. Shrek's cousin said, Easy, just file a lawsuit saying that one of the employees injured you. This might get you a pretty hefty cash settlement from Ikea if you ever escape, and the SCP Foundation doesn't get you with amnestics first. The staff unfortunately seem to have less respect for the rule of law. moocow for you 2 said, Talk about SCP-2521 and be instantly removed from the store. This would be a method to escape, yes, but we can't promise you'd like where it takes you any more than SCP-3008. Tiny Sarv said, I would tell the staff that they should let me see their manager for the poor customer service, and if I die, so be it. Ah, the little-known SCP-3008-3, also known as the Karen. The one entity found within SCP-3008 that is perhaps even more terrifying than the staff. You can definitely try this technique, but we can't promise it will get the results you want. There doesn't seem to be an entity above the staff that is controlling them, or even managing their schedules and days off like Demon Dan's unseen supervisor. But if there was, it would likely be something even more terrifying than the staff and you would probably think that the staff is doing an okay job. And if you don't like it, you can take your business elsewhere. Dawawa said, I'd simply die. Hey, we appreciate your honesty, at least. But we think it's generally better to hold on to hope. 
trying your best to survive and perhaps even escape this terrifying anomalous situation. After all, you're only truly out when you count yourself out. P&Q Cowboy Channel said, I would start to worship the staff and even give them sacrifices. This is definitely a creative solution, but not one that we actually think would solve anything. After all, the staff aren't actually sentient beings. They seem to act on pure instinct, attacking any interlopers within the store at night. So no amount of sacrifices will ever truly appease them. You're better off teaming up with other humans and fighting for survival. Grace Ng said, I'll eat the monsters, they look delicious. Well, thank you for sharing, Grace. And as for the rest of you, if you ever find yourself inside the infinite Ikea and you happen to see Grace prowling the showroom near you, then perhaps keep your distance. Especially if she looks hungry. If she's willing to eat the staff, who knows what else she's capable of. Fortnite Stuff said, I would survive in a weird way. I would die, then I would be out. While we suppose you would technically be out of the infinite Ikea in a grim existential sense, we think you may have misunderstood the meaning of survive there. But don't worry, you'll be able to learn about all that and more from our new sister channel, Words Explained. Uh, okay, I made that up. Sorry. Mr. Mr. Derp said, As someone who has been in several Ikeas, never use the men's room. Ooh, ooh God. We're so sorry. We can only imagine the horrific things you've seen. It'll probably make 682 shudder in fear. Kiru-chan said, I would build a community inside and make myself the leader. Make people fight and find food on my behalf. Nothing is better than being lazy and having people at your command. While all of the strange communities within SCP-3008 do require a leader, if you try to install yourself as some kind of flat-pack dictator, chances are you're going to get overthrown during a revolution and exiled. At which point you'll probably be killed by the staff. The message? Be nice to people. Kindness costs nothing, after all. And if you're going to be trapped in an Ikea with a bunch of strangers for potentially years on end, you're going to want them to actually like you. Toxic Dynamics said, I would just watch the Infographic Show's video, You vs. SCP-3008, and do what they say. Yes, that is an excellent video, containing everything you need to know about surviving your time in SCP-3008. I think we should all watch it, and then subscribe to the Infographic Show for more great videos every day. And of course, ring the bell to turn on notifications. That's the best idea we've heard all day. And there we have it, folks. Thanks to everyone for sending in their thoughts and ideas. If you want to be involved in the next one, keep an eye on our community post for the next opportunity for you to throw in your two SCP cents. And in the meantime, maybe do your furniture shopping online. Oh god, oh god, I'm trapped in the infinite Ikea. How long have I been in here? Can I get out? How can I get out? How can I survive the vicious staff of the infinite Ikea and work with the other survivors in this terrifying endless building? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Day one. I'd come to this flat pack nightmare with my lovely wife, Brenda, to pick up some stupid sofa she saw online. We could have ordered it in, but me being a cheapskate and a fool, instead decided it'd be a dandy idea to head in and pick it up ourselves even though I can't stand shopping in these giant stores. Of course, it didn't take long for us to get separated. I was wandering around, just pretending I knew what I was doing, surrounded by unfamiliar people. Then, not surrounded by any people at all. Like the complete doofus I was, I'd somehow gotten lost. Just needed to find my bearings again, and then I could call Brenda to come save me. But I never did find my bearings. The hours went on, and I was still lost. Day two. My dominant emotion on this day was nothing more than sheer humiliation, knowing I had been bested by a damn Swedish furniture store. I spent the night before sleeping on a futon, wondering how I'd gotten myself into this flat pack calamity. I spent the day searching for food, my confusion and exhaustion increasing by the moment. For a while, I even entertained the idea that I might have died and gone to some Nordic hell. At night, I went to bed hungry, knowing if I didn't eat soon, I might be found as a skeleton on a dusty old futon. God, it came in like this. I can't die on day two. Day three. I continued my journey through the labyrinthian bowels of the Ikea, disoriented by the endlessly iterating collections of cheap furniture. You know, there was something terrifying about the emptiness of it all. This affordable but impossible to assemble void. Starvation has always been one of the most horrific deaths, hasn't it? You could only imagine my relief when I saw the figure standing a few feet in front of me, dressed like a member of IKEA staff. I'd found salvation. I'd found someone who could help me out of here. But when I approached, I realized something was horribly wrong. 
This wasn't a human being standing before me. It was a monster. The being I'd later come to know is called the Staff by the many people who fear them. It chased me, repeating, The store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, flailing for me with its long, frightening limbs. I only survived day three because I locked myself in a closet and just waited while it hammered against the wood with its fists. Once the night was over, it left and I was able to escape. Day four. I was feeling some intense hunger pangs on this day. Not to mention the fact that I now knew there were monsters out there just waiting to beat me to death if they caught me when the lights turned down. Needless to say, I wasn't in the best headspace, and I didn't have enough charge on my phone to justify opening up my meditation app. Then, I found Nirvana. I found the cafeteria, stocked full of delicious, warm Swedish meatballs. You know, no food has ever tasted so sweet to me. And this delicious meal also gave way to one of the most exciting new developments, Gloria. Gloria was a veteran. She taught me everything I needed to know about this place. Even on the first day I met her, she felt like someone I'd known for years. It was her that took me back to her home in this place. A little fortress made of Ikea furniture filled with a whole community of other people trapped in there. It was like being allowed into the Garden of Eden. Day five, and it feels good to be alive. I met up with all the different people around the camp. They tell me the most bizarre and fascinating stories. Uh, this sounds crazy, I know, but I get the sense not all of them came from the same place as me. Different Ikeas in different countries, or maybe even as nutty as it sounds, from different worlds. One guy, Tony, who's been trapped in here for a year and some change, we got to talking about different vacations we'd taken on the outside. He told me he was from New York, and I told him I visited there once, and I'd love going to see the Statue of Liberty up close. That's when he told me that he'd never heard of the Statue of Liberty. You know, I didn't know what to make of that. Strange little details aside, I couldn't be happier to be there with other people. The next step would be finding a way out of here, and back to Brenda. Day 6. Gloria and several others led me out on our first excursion. Missions where the goal was to collect more food and supplies and map out the surrounding area. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw a staff member standing in our path at one point, and the others all just laughed at me. The staff member just stood there, placid and still. Gloria told me that it's okay. The staff are harmless during the day. It's only nighttime when they enter their pattern of aggression. So long as you don't get lost during the daytime, you're generally fine. The team often used strength, like Thesis, to trail behind them and ensure they don't get lost. It was clear they'd been here long enough to work out systems for every possibility. Felt like I was in good hands with them. We collected meatballs and some rugs to fortify the walls and headed back. Day 7. This was the first night that we had to fend off a full-on attack. Those monsters. The staff came at us in huge groups, pounding at the outside of our perimeter with their bald fists. It was terrifying. As we were fighting them off, we tied Ikea kitchen knives to the end of curtain rails and speared them, one by one, until all of them were dead. <sighs> they just kept coming. More and more and more of them. When it looked like one of the walls to the north of the community was going to fall, everyone around me started to panic. That's when Barry, one of the biggest men in the camp, grabbed a hammer in each hand and went outside. He fought like a beast, taking on staff member after staff member, tanking hit after hit. It was something to see. That's when he took off into the depths of the store, drawing the staff away behind him and saving us all. We never saw Barry again after that, but he's the reason all of us made it past day seven. Thank you, Barry, wherever you are. Day eight. Gloria took me out alone today on another search for the escape. That's when she told me about her sister. She'd gone shopping in Ikea with her well over a year ago now, when she was separated and got lost in here, just like me. I had a lot in common with her, including my feelings of guilt for abandoning my loved ones and my drive to escape and be united with them. While we were out that day, we didn't find anything useful. Gloria seemed sad, but unsurprised. The infinite Ikea had its way of slowly grinding you down. Days nine to day 17. Despite a rocky start, I was finding my legs in the infinite Ikea. I started to get to know my fellow Ikea prisoners. I started to understand and truly befriend them. We went on expeditions pretty much daily, either to collect new food, more supplies to help build up our community, or to keep searching for an exit. To me, it started to feel like we were making progress, and that helped a great deal to keep my emotions semi-stable. But it wasn't the same for Gloria. After all, she'd been here for so much longer than me, and she had her sister to consider on the outside. To her, these routines I was becoming part of now felt like a prison within a prison. She was trapped. Had her sister forgotten her out there? Had she been declared dead? 
Were people even still looking for her? And it was on day 18 that it all got a little too much for poor Gloria. She snuck out of the camp at night, when the staff were most active trying to find the exit. Sadly, that had cost Gloria her life. There's no way of knowing what happened to her exactly, but considering how bruised up her body was when we found her, it was easy to make an educated guess. She'd gotten bum-rushed by the staff and beaten to death before she could have even mustered up a defense. It was a horrible way to go. We tried giving her a dignified funeral as we could, given the circumstances, closing her up in a body-sized box. That was the day I decided to stop just trying to survive and start trying to escape. I owe that to Brenda. If she really had gotten out, I couldn't keep her waiting. But I wouldn't be alone. As it turns out, another two members of the little Ikea community I'd come to know were willing to risk it all with me. A man named Kelvin and a young woman named Vicky. They were sick of just waiting around and fending off attacks from the staff night after night. They both told me they'd rather die during an escape attempt than while cowering under a pile of cheap rugs. And so, each armed with claw hammers from the six-piece Ikea Fix-A toolkit and as many Pruta Tupperware containers full of meatballs that we could carry, we set off into the great unknown of Ikea. We traveled for weeks, marking our tracks on the ground with the Mala Mixed Colors chalk selection so we never got caught going in circles. One day bled into the next. Nights were spent trying to hide in closets and bathtubs while the staff hunted relentlessly for people just like us. Every single time, we got lucky. That is, until day 41. Here's something you need to know about the infinite Ikea. You're probably already aware, if you're watching this, that the 24-hour cycle of night and day is dictated by the store lights up above. But the space between day and night isn't a gradient here. It's a cliff. You can be minding your own business when suddenly, hitch darkness, and now the staff are on your ass. That's exactly what happened on day 41. We're in the middle of a kitchenware selection, surrounded by a few docile members of staff, when suddenly, the lights switched off, and they went hostile on us. They look pretty goofy after the initial shock has worn off, but believe me when I say that these monsters can really pack a mean wallop when they want to. And we received a reminder of this unfortunate fact that night. The staff swarmed us, repeating that awful phrase, the store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, while they struck and flailed at us. If it wasn't for our trusty claw hammers, we would have been dead that night. Thankfully, we were able to give better than we were getting. We managed to kill a decent number of staff members, and then make a run for a section with better hiding places. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin all stowed away in a large wardrobe, until we saw light flickering through the crack in the door, like we were rejected extras for some painful community theater take on the Chronicles of Narnia. But while we survived that night, we didn't survive unscathed. My face was swollen from a nasty punch one of the staff members dealt me, and from the pain in my chest, I might have been dealing with a few broken ribs. Kelvin sprained his ankle during the escape, and Vicky had a cut on her forehead from when one of the staff members kneed her in the face during the fray. You never win these fights, you just survive them. We made a temporary camp in the area where we could rest and recover, as well as shaking off the justifiable fear of death or grievous harm that dampened our resolve to get out of this place. That took us to day 53. Of course, food was always a concern. I don't want to romanticize what happened in there, as much as I'm sure someone on the outside might want to imagine this whole experience as some kind of exciting survival horror game, but I assure you, it was less survival horror and more survival and horror. Meaning not only are we suffering from constant fear, stress, and paranoia for our safety in here, but we also need to keep ourselves fed and watered. You're just as likely to die from starvation in here as you are to be beaten to death. We went in search of another Ikea kitchen where we could fill up on more water and meatballs, your lifeblood in a place like this. It took us several more days of searching and hiding, searching and hiding, before we hit pay dirt. By the time we actually got our hands on the food and water, we were starving and practically coughing up dust. Those meatballs were the most delicious food I've ever tasted, and I could tell from their faces that Kelvin and Vicky felt exactly the same way. Though, at the moment, I told myself if no. When I get out of here, I never eat another meatball. It'd probably give me war flashbacks, or I guess store flashbacks? We filled up our Tupperware and shoved them back into our Kia proving backpacks. Then we needed to keep moving, keep searching, and keep marking the ground behind us as we fanned out into the great flat pack yonder, avoiding confrontations wherever we could. The three of us still had no idea what insanity was waiting for us out there. 
We had no idea that there were even more dangerous things than the staff lurking in the shadows. Day 68. Of course I kept count, writing it down on the back of my Jatelik coloring book. Trust me, when every night could mean a horrible death, you keep track of the nights. Not a single one of them escapes you. At a certain point, I think we all adapted in our own way. It was back to caveman times again, learning to be like our primal ancestors, hiding away from the dark and the monsters that hid there. So it was extremely surprising for us to get the most brutal attack during the day. At first, I thought we were being attacked by the staff during daylight hours, like a bolt from the blue. That's when we noticed they weren't attacking with their hands. They were all holding kitchen knives, holding us up like bandits. That's when we realized what had actually happened here. We weren't being attacked by the staff. We were being attacked by other humans dressed like the staff, wearing their hollowed out heads like grisly masks. They told us that we were coming with them, and if we resisted, they'd cut us to ribbons. And seeing as none of us were movie action heroes, we thought it'd be best to do exactly what they said. This is how we fell into the clutches of Generalissimo Vardagen. Day 69. But things were not nice. I mean, I get it. Yeah, ha, ha funny. Nice. I don't know if I'd mentioned this before, but the community I became part of in the Infinite Ikea after meeting Gloria was just one of many. Nobody knows exactly how many people are trapped in here. I'm hardly a martyr for spending 68 days in there. I know people who've been trapped in there for years, who've given all hope of escape and accepted their lot in life. They became the elders of a lot of these communities, helping others adjust. Though, of course, Generalissimo Vartagen was not one of these people. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin were dragged by the strangers dressed as staff members into a fort made of smashed up wood nailed together into a huge, ominous structure. It was a far more extensive structure than any of the communities I'd visited or even heard about before in the infinite Ikea. It was a true fortress, guarded by many more of those knife-wielding people dressed in the clothes and in the flesh of the staff. It looked like some evil cult straight out of a damn horror movie. I had never seen anything like it. We were dragged into a kind of tent in the middle of the camp, made out of stitched together rugs. That's where we met Generalissimo Vardagen, surrounded by his guards. I'd later learn his namesake was a set of steak knives stocked in the IKEA kitchenware sections, similar to the knives being wielded by his gallery of goons. The Generalissimo himself was dressed like some absurd tin pot dictator, wearing a silly hat and a jacket covered in fake metals. His whole presence felt like a cosmic punishment for daring to believe things couldn't get any more absurd than they already were. His men forced us down onto our knees, and Vardagen cleared his throat to speak. Quake in the fear as the sight of this Ikea's ruler, the great and powerful Generalissimo Vardagen. I have united kingdoms from the gardening and bathroom supplies departments and crushed dissenting tribes in the office furniture sections to the west. If you wish to live, you will swear fealty to me and join my legion of servants. If you do as I say, you will be given safety and security from the staff come nightfall. If you do not bend the knee, I will have you destroyed! By the time his little spiel was done, the man was red in the face and sweating profusely. It was clear that, much like your average IKEA shelving unit after a couple weeks of use, the great Generalissimo Vardagen had a few screws loose. None of us liked the idea of becoming slaves to some flat-packed Genghis Khan, so we tried to persuade him to just let us go telling him that we hoped to escape the store, and with our help, he could escape too. That's when we learned a sobering lesson. For some people, life inside the infinite Ikea was better than life outside. In the real world, the Generalissimo had been a twice-divorced ex-salary man with nothing to his name but debts and regrets. But here, he was a demigod, a leader among the rest of us mere mortals. Why would he ever want to go back to the world that had given him nothing and taken everything? Day 70 to day 84. We were forced into weeks of hard labor after that, toiling under the Generalissimo and his gang of brigands. The soldiers worked us like dogs, making us carry food and furniture back to the Generalissimo's Scandinavian furniture fortress. One day bled into the next. The best I could say about any of this was at least we were safe behind the walls of the fortress at night, so we didn't need to worry about getting murdered by the staff in our sleep. However, tragedy struck again on day 85. 
Kelvin couldn't take the work anymore. One day, I think his mind just snapped. He refused to follow orders from the Generalissimo and his lieutenants, even when they threatened him with death. Sadly, that night they would prove that this wasn't just some empty threat. When night fell, they tied up Kelvin's arms and legs and left him outside the fortress. We were just forced to watch as the staff assembled and beat our friend to death while he lay there, unable to defend himself. Even in all the time I'd spent in the infinite Ikea, that was the most harrowing thing I'd ever seen. But in one of the few acts of righteous cosmic justice that we'd seen since being trapped in here all those months ago, just a few days after Kelvin's brutal execution, Day 90, the day of the revolution. While I'd love to tell you that I started this, there are no heroes in this story. I just happened to be the one telling you about it. Some internal conflict between the Generalissimo and his men boiled over into a kind of civil war that tore the fortress apart from within. Vicky and I escaped, but in different directions. I'd like to imagine she got out in the end. It helps me sleep at night. But one thing I will tell you, Generalissimo Vardagen found out what happened to tyrants, big and small, when his closest confidants give him the Julius Caesar treatment with the knives from which he took his name. I don't think there's anything wrong in taking a little joy in that. For days afterwards, I just walked. I felt so empty, but I refused to just lay down and let myself die. Even though so much of the hope had been beaten out of me, I couldn't betray Brenda by just giving up in here. It wouldn't be right. It just wouldn't be right. The days ticked on and nothing changed. I had no food, no weapons, and I was getting so tired. Then night fell, and the staff started chasing me. They seemed even more aggressive than before. I couldn't fight. All I could do was run. I ran, and I ran, and I ran, not even looking where I was going as the crowd of staff started catching up with me. Getting closer and closer, I ran until there was a doorway before me. I didn't even think. I just was trying to get away. That's when I noticed that the store's roof was no longer above me. For the first time in 100 days, I was once again tasting fresh air. That's right, folks. On day 100, I was out. I truly made it out. This victory, however, was short-lived. A group of about six staff members burst out of the front door behind me, charging towards me with ferocious speed. I couldn't move, all I could do was grit my teeth and wince, ready to accept my death at what had otherwise been the high point of my recent life. What a depressing irony that would be. But instead, gunshots rang out through the air. A hail of bullets cleaved through the staff members, dropping them to the ground mere feet away from me, stone dead. That's when I turned to see a group of men with assault rifles and tactical gear walking towards me. In any other situation, this might have been terrifying, but right then, it was the happiest moment of my life. These men took me away from the parking lot of what is now an abandoned Ikea. They told me they were from a group called the SCP Foundation, and that I'd been declared missing for some time now. I didn't care about any of that. I just asked them if Brenda had gotten out. If she hadn't escaped too, then this was all for nothing. You can't even imagine my relief when they told me that Brenda was never even trapped. She was the one who reported my disappearance after I dropped off the face of the earth in what she thought was a perfectly normal IKEA shopping session, before that building was shut down and cordoned off under some less insane pretense. But Brenda was alive and safe, and I'd get to be with her again. I have no shame in telling you I cried, but I'd like to specify that they were absolutely tears of joy. The men from the SCP Foundation told me that they'd give me a medicine that had helped me forget all this after I told them my story, and there's no part of me that has a problem with that. Some things are better left forgotten. But before the SCP Foundation wipes it all away from my mind and I get to go live with my beloved wife once more, this was how I survived 100 <laughs> dreadful days in the infinite Ikea. It was such a normal morning, almost comically uneventful. For the first time in what felt like forever, the morning newscasts had very little to say. They covered Fashion Week, some protests in the capital, a new health craze sweeping the nation, a funny viral video of a dog eating a pancake, the inspirational story of a young boy from the Midwest beating cancer, a minor political scandal out of Tallahassee, Florida that nobody would remember in a week, a round of interviews with an expert who'd written a new book about the long-term effects social media might have on our children. None of them knew back then that long-term was a luxury they couldn't afford. People went to work, to school, some took the day off. Plenty took walks or jogs, deciding to exercise outside for a change. After all, it was such a beautiful sunny day out. What a terrible shame it would be to waste the light indoors. People were sleepwalking, 
so placidly, blissfully unaware of what was rattling down the tracks towards them. It was an uncharacteristically slow day down at Site-19. There hadn't been any containment breaches in over a week. A couple of new anomalies had been brought into containment, one safe class and one Euclid, but neither were the kind that was likely to bring the SCP Foundation any trouble. Right now, the biggest threat facing their employees seemed to be boredom and they definitely take that over any other members of their rogues gallery. Dr. Bright poured himself a mug of nice, hot coffee and decided to watch some TV in the break room, just to pass the time. The President of the United States was giving a press conference on the White House lawn, surrounded by microphones. It was really nothing special, just the same inane babble about how he was going to fix the deficit, and with inflation on the rise, we'd all need to work on being more fiscally responsible. The Immortal Foundation researcher sipped his coffee. These normal, boring problems felt like the perfect escape from the insanity he needed to deal with every day at the Foundation. The President was saying something about the importance of families and about farmers being the nation's real backbone when something happened. There was an odd shift in the quality of the light. Dr. Bright barely registered it. Maybe it was something to do with the cameras. However, things started to get stranger. The president's speech began to slur, as though he'd just been pumped with enough morphine to take down an elephant. But it wasn't just that. He was sweating buckets, too. Wet patches expanded all over his suit, and perspiration was dripping off his skin. Dr. Bright was in suspense. Was he about to watch the president have a stroke live on air? Would he be called in to replace him yet again? But no. The situation unfolding was far, far worse. The President of the United States slumped forward over his podium while the reporting corps screamed. His face sloughed off his skull like melting wax, the President's words slurring off into infinity. It was the worst a U.S. President had looked on film since SCP-1981. Dr. Bright dropped his coffee cup. It tumbled and shattered onto the ground below. The camera fell as the operator screamed. It pointed down into the crowd where the reporters were shrieking in pain and terror, steam coming off their bodies with the sudden intense climb and heat. They were all melting. All of them were melting before his very eyes broadcast out to how many people it would be the mother of all containment nightmares. Little did Dr. Bright know, that wasn't even the half of the true horrors unfolding. Alarms went off across every containment site in the world. Any SCP Foundation employees unlucky enough to be standing outside at the time were lost in the rapidly unfolding horrors. They screamed as the sun cleaved their atoms apart, reducing them into semi-liquid states without the mercy of death. People lucky to be just out of the sun could only watch as those less fortunate disintegrated across the ground in unholy shrieking puddles. Never had such a normal day been thrown into such terrifying chaos in so little time. Billions of voices cried out at once as the sun changed in the sky above them. Since the dawn of humanity, it had given us everything. Light to bask in, warmth to keep us safe, and the life of the plants and animals that kept us fed. It had been worshipped as a god by countless cultures over thousands of years, one great mother to all of humanity. And now, that mother was drowning us in the bathtub. And perhaps the most frightening part of all, it was for seemingly no reason. No reason at all. The SCP Foundation was forced to now break their silence forever. The masquerade, the veil, it melted along with so much of humanity. They took over every communications channel in the world and did what they could to inform people on how to get out of harm's way. Stay inside. Wrap yourself in sun-shielding clothing and only move at night. Air travel is preferable, if possible. If you can, make your way to one of the SCP Foundation's secure sites, their only chance of preserving humanity and figuring out how to reverse this new nightmare. Now more than ever, the SCP Foundation would be humanity's only hope. Until, of course, there was another terrifying twist in the tale. While those who were melted into piles of living flesh sludge were sadly assumed to be lost, even the Foundation didn't expect the transformed humans to become a threat in and of themselves. Just as their bodies were melted, so were their minds. They became slaves, cultists of the growing tyrant hanging up above. 
Some would coagulate into huge, fleshing masses, horrifying threats that would seek out victims, overpower them, and drag them out into the light to be absorbed and transformed. Even those hiding inside Foundation containment centers weren't safe. These behemoths of melted flesh would find their way in, using their many twisted voices to slowly break the minds of their victims, then gather them up with great flesh tendrils and yank them out into their doom. Little by little, the numbers of humanity dwindled. It looked like we had a bright future ahead of us. And in this particular context, that's far from a good thing. Survivors, for whatever time they had left, would forever remember this walking nightmare. The Foundation dubbed it SCP-001 to reflect its ultimacy, but to everyone else it had a different name. When day breaks. In a world where anything but darkness will kill you, is there anywhere left on Earth that's truly safe from the horrors of SCP-001? Five months into the never-ending horror of the solar singularity, Alice spooned herself a bowl full of warm Swedish meatballs. Delicious. She was part of an investigative detail from a nearby community, deep within the bowels of the only truly safe place for human beings on planet Earth. SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. No sun had ever shone in there, only the lights, which fizz and flicker far above. Everyone inside thinks of it as a prison. Little do they know, what's left of humanity out there would kill to be inside this sanctuary. Alice had a team of ten with her. Their mission was simple. Continue the mapping effort of the area surrounding their community and collect rations for the rest of the camp. It was dangerous work, especially as night drew close, but there were certain rewards. When they reached a feeding station, they were able to enjoy fresher food than anyone else. All they needed to do was wager their lives for it. To Alice, it seemed like a fair trade. Her Lieutenant Darcy kept watch to the north. He and several others wielded makeshift spears made from curtain rods and clubs fashioned from bedposts. Knives scavenged from the kitchen section hung from their belts in makeshift holsters. During the day, they were little more than a precaution. At night, it could mean the difference between life and death. Speaking of, Darcy kept a close watch on a member of staff. It was a lanky, faceless monster in that garish uniform, with a bulbous, oversized head and long arms, hanging slack like pulled taffy, dragging its knuckles along the ground as it stumbled along. Darcy thought it darkly funny how stupid they could look in the daytime, like crash test dummies rejected from the assembly line. Bear stood close by. He never gave any of them his real name, so they took to calling him Bear, because he was big, hairy, and would probably tear you to shreds if you got on his bad side. He wielded the largest club of all, a customized creation with sharp objects sticking out of it on all sides. It cleaved the heads of many staff members off their bodies. Bear seemed to relish the task of putting those monsters down. For him, it was easy and fun. That's why he was an essential asset on these missions. A berserker. Most of the grunts shoveled as much food as they could carry in IKEA-branded Tupperware and coolers. The more they gathered, the longer it would take for them to be forced out beyond the safe walls of the haven they built inside this Swedish flatpack hell. They all made do with what they had in here. It was all they could really do. Two members of the team were unaccounted for, Cyril and Joseph, would pass for reconnaissance experts down here. They seemed to have an innate sense of direction, as though they were somehow in tune with the IKEA itself. They would be sent out on scouting missions, searching for resources, food, other survivors, and most prized of all, potential escape routes. It was a dream, a fantasy, that someday one of them would find the exit and lead the rest of them to salvation through it. Alice had been trapped in the infinite Ikea for six years, going on seven now. She had long since given up on dreams of escape. All they could do was accept their situation, get used to it, and just try to survive under these circumstances. But those circumstances were about to change. Everyone looked up when they heard panicked breathing. It was Cyril, just Cyril. The party clutched their weapons just that little bit tighter, unsure of what had happened. Their rules were clear. Scouting duos must never, ever separate under any circumstances. Getting lost in the store and being isolated when the lights went out would be a death sentence. So if Cyril was returning alone, frightened, 
tears streaking down his face, then something truly awful had happened. He told Alice and the rest of the group that something had attacked him and Joseph. When Alice told him that was impossible, that the staff wouldn't show active aggression until lights out until someone attacked them first, Cyril shook his head and let out a heaving sob. He told them that the creature that attacked them wasn't a member of staff, it was something else entirely. Something he'd never seen inside the Ikea before. A true monster. Whatever this creature was, it moved around a corner incredibly fast. It spoke in a way that was almost human, but something was off about it. Something that sent a chill down Cyril's spine just thinking about it. He recalled that the creature was large and blob-like, flesh-colored, with long grasping tendrils that whipped and flailed unnaturally. These tendrils had wrapped around and grasped Joseph. He hadn't been quick enough. The two of them were too shocked by the sight of it to react in time. And then it was already too late. It grabbed Joseph and yanked him off into an adjoining aisle. Cyril still remembered his haunting screams getting quieter and quieter as he moved further out of sight. On some level, everyone hoped that Cyril was lying. It was preferable to believe that he himself had snapped and murdered Joseph for some unknown reason, as opposed to some new, stronger, and even more dangerous creature that was now inside the Ikea. Was this some kind of upgrade? As they acclimated to the environment, adapted, gotten better at surviving here, had the Ikea in turn created deadlier countermeasures to destroy them all? just when you thought you had a handle on things. But if Cyril was telling the truth, and there was some kind of creature lurking in the store, or potentially more than just one, then they could be in danger just standing here. They gathered up the group, along with any supplies worth taking, and set off back to their community. They would need to deliver the bad news so they could potentially prepare for the worst. It was just one of the many communities housed within SCP-3008. Many have theorized over the years that the infinite IKEA acts as a kind of nexus point for IKEAs all across the multiverse, accounting for the truly insane number of people who have gone missing without a trace into the building over the years. There were children who had been born in the Ikea, raised in the Ikea, known nothing but the Ikea. Nobody knew an exact number for sure, but it was more than possible that the population of a small country resided within its walls. Sometimes communities would fracture and fall apart, occasionally due to a lack of resources or infighting, other times due to an overwhelming attack from the staff that physically destroyed the settlement often leaving many of its members dead in the process. Those who weren't picked off while wandering the store in the following days would likely integrate into other nearby communities as refugees. Life was cruel in the infinite Ikea. By the time Alice and her party returned to their community, it was almost lights out. They spoke to the community leaders and informed them of Joseph's tragic disappearance, as well as this awful new creature that Cyril claimed had taken him. They thought it best not to inform the rest of the community tonight. It might hurt their focus and cause unnecessary panic. Alice agreed to join the watch that night. She could feel something wrong in the air. Even more so than usual, there was something terrible in this anomalous Ikea. Alice stood atop the furniture wall with several other rangers. As the lights flickered off, the distinctive calls sounded across the store from the activated staff members. The store is now It was almost soothing in its familiarity, compared to the frightening thoughts that Cyril had left swimming through her mind. The staff she could handle, it was at least the devil she knew, and there were worse beasts than the devil out there. She knew it in her bones. They killed a few staff members that happened to wander towards the community and began beating their deformed fists against the walls. All standard procedure. But as Alice's eyes adjusted to the darkness, she saw a huge shape in the distance. It looked like a mountain that breathed. A huge wobbling mass of flesh, moving impossibly fast for a creature of its size. It was so much vaster than the creature that Cyril had described earlier. Was this a different one, or had it simply gotten bigger? Either way, it was coming straight towards them. The community came alive in sudden panic. Every able-bodied adult grabbed their weapons and prepared for the fight of their lives behind the wall. Whatever this monster was, they needed to kill it as quickly as possible, before it destroyed everything they built. Sadly for everyone inside the community, 
This was one fight that none of them were prepared for. The beast crashed into the furniture wall, crushing it inwards. People struck at the monster's immense and terrible flesh with their weapons, making awful wet slaps, but seeming to cause no lasting impact. It just kept rolling in, grasping everyone it could with its long, sinewy tendrils. But the horrors were only just beginning. With the wall destroyed, the staff began to pour in, chanting in monstrous unison, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. It was a massacre, perhaps one of the worst that the inside of the infinite Ikea had ever seen. While the community battled the giant flesh beast, the forces of the staff swarmed and overwhelmed them. Darcy was tangled in the nightmarish tentacles of the beast. Bear was surrounded by a truly insurmountable number of staff members, each one bawling their terrible fists and beating him to death. Somewhere Cyril screamed, though his scream was soon cut short. Alice watched in horror as everything she'd known was destroyed. Alice realized her friends were dead and her community was in ruins. She grabbed her spear and did the only thing she could. She ran. She ran from the lost cause that had once been her life, tears running down her cheeks. What had even happened? What the hell had that great monster been? The Ikea's trump card? She ran aimlessly for as long as she could, then walked and eventually limped. She went on for hours, getting lost deeper and deeper into unknown territory. She'd stop when she was dead. Why not? She had little left to live for. But like the Holy Grail, when she eventually truly gave up and stopped looking for salvation, it found its way to her. As she turned a corner down a mysterious aisle, she saw something that she hadn't seen in years. Glass double doors. She stifled a sob. Could it be the way out of here after all this time? And it was. The world. Escape. She'd lost everything, but regained this. Outside, dawn was breaking. After years, the great red sun. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen in her life. She took a deep breath, smiled, and stepped into the light. Anyone working at the SCP Foundation will no doubt be familiar with SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. For those of you that aren't, it essentially does what it says on the can. Or rather, it's assembled just like it is in the flat pack furniture instructions. While on the outside it appears to be an average, unassuming branch of the affordable Swedish furniture outlet, inside is a different story. Crossing the boundary of SCP-3008's automatic doors and venturing a little too deep into its maze-like confines leads to an endless labyrinth of Kullens and Hurdals, a dimensionally transcendental area that defies our ordinary human understanding of physical space. Lurking deep within the aisles of the infinite IKEA are SCP-3008-2s, better known as the Staff, a race of misshapen, faceless humanoids with long, freakish arms that prey on anyone that enters once night falls. And yes, there are people inside SCP-3008, trapped souls that have wandered into the wrong IKEA, only to end up missing, sometimes spending months or even years inside, if they ever get out at all. An alert was ringing, filling the air with loud, blaring noise. Every member of Foundation personnel stationed outside the infinite IKEA was rushing about, guards standing at the ready. The storefront of SCP-3008 had been silent for quite a long while, with nothing reported going in or coming out. But the Foundation knew far better than to assume that SCP-3008 didn't have surprises in store for them. Pun fully intended. Hey, don't you dare click off! We know where you live and Red Right Hand are lining up the shot. <clears throat> anyway... There appeared to be some kind of commotion beyond the doors that quickly slid open just in time for something to be slung through the front entrance. It almost looked as if the IKEA itself had spat something out, like it was so toxic it couldn't endure having to keep it within its confines any longer. Cautiously approaching with their weapons raised, the Foundation's on-site security team moved towards the discarded mess to get a better look at whatever it was. It turned out to be a person a man in around his late fifties, beaten within an inch of his life. He was wearing some kind of rudimentary circlet or crown around his head, 
seemingly fashioned by hand out of stationery and other materials scavenged from the paper shop department of the infinite Ikea. Speaking of, the man was wearing an Ikea manager's uniform, with a name tag pinned to his chest that identified him as Chris. Hanging from his neck was an Ikea-branded notepad with a message scrawled on it. But before you find out what that message was, we have another important message for you. One that directly impacts you. Yes, I'm talking directly to you. It comes from the sponsor of today's video, Private Internet Access. We know you've heard a lot of big claims from a lot of different VPN providers, but you absolutely must hear why we've chosen PIA as our personal VPN and why you should do the same. Unlike the SCP Foundation and some of those other VPN services out there, PIA is the world's most transparent VPN provider. They never record or store any user data at all. Don't believe us? Their no-log policy has been proven multiple times in court and was even verified by an independent audit by Deloitte. And they stay transparent so that you don't have to. With PIA's VPN, your IP address is hidden and your connection is encrypted, keeping your digital life protected from the prying eyes of network admins or even a certain mobile task Force unit. And they've just launched what is maybe their coolest feature yet. With servers now in all 50 US states, you can look like you're surfing the web from exactly where you want. Need to look like you're checking out that SCP database entry from Indiana? They've got an IP address for you there. Or maybe you're on the West Coast and want to catch the early East Coast premiere of your favorite show and avoid spoilers. Not a problem with private internet access. I could go on and on about all the features I regularly use, but why not try it yourself by going to www.piavpn.com forward slash SCP and get an 82% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.11 a month. Plus, get three extra months completely for free. Not long before Chris was found in his roughed-up state outside the only IKEA that goes on forever, he was working at a different branch, one that was much smaller on the inside. Chris was the manager of the store and widely regarded by his employees to be an awful person. Nobody knew if he had always been that way or if instilling him in a position of power over other retail workers had somehow caused him to develop a bit of a god complex. Either way, there was little he ever did to invoke much camaraderie with his colleagues. Whenever any of the store's workers were on their breaks, which they usually had to remind Chris were permitted by law and not optional, conversation often turned to their collective poor opinions of their manager. He'd been given the job out of pretty blatant nepotism. It was well known how cozy Chris was with the regional manager of all the IKEA stores in the area. On top of that, Chris had a pretty nasty habit of trying to force his employees to stay behind after their scheduled shifts had finished, while also refusing to pay them for overtime. You see, it was his own mismanagement of the work rota that had left the store understaffed at crucial moments of the day. The solution, you would think, should be obvious. Hiring a few more new staff to help with the workload and to start their shifts at times when others were about to clock out for the day. Ah, but new employees wouldn't work for free their wages would come out of the store's budget, and why would Chris want to take on new workers? As the person in charge of payroll, he could help himself to that money, adding the wages of prospective colleagues as a bonus, on top of his own unjustifiably exorbitant salary. Perhaps the worst part about having Chris as a manager was that he seemed to get away with murder. As long as the store kept making a profit, then the management above him didn't care how badly he treated his employees or flouted the rules for his own gain. But it was those same colleagues who had suffered and been scorned by Chris's behavior who had finally had enough. Retail work is hard. Having to deal with rude and impolite customers on a day-to-day -day basis, working long hours of uninteresting and repetitive labor, all for a paycheck that only just covered rent. Like we said, it is a hard line of work, and the people in it deserve the utmost respect. But you throw a megalomaniacal manager into the mix, and you've got a ticking time bomb on your hands. One that'll sooner or later explode. It was witnessing Chris blatantly framing a younger member of staff that finally triggered detonation. The kid had only been a student, working at IKEA all through his weekends to make enough money to pay his bills. Chris saw this less experienced employee not as a human being doing his best, but a chance to make a quick buck by breaking the rules. The manager started stealing cash from the register, 
then blamed it on his young staff member when the losses started to show on the store's monthly financial reports. Seeing that for themselves, the other members of the staff knew that it was the manager's responsibility to empty the registers regularly, so they didn't have too much cash in them in case of a robbery. Given how much they all despised Chris, it didn't take much effort for the entire workforce to organize a walkout halfway through the working day. Outraged, Chris had tried calling any colleagues that were off shift, barking at them to come in and work on their days off. All of them said no. The thing is, when you work in retail, complaints to upper management never seem to go anywhere. Like we said, if the store's making profit, that's all they care about. But seeing such drastic action from the staff of the store he was supposed to be running, the IKEA higher-ups came down on Chris like a hammer. They instructed that he be sent to another IKEA outlet for a whole afternoon to receive some mandatory interpersonal training. Little did anyone realize that this was the last anyone would ever see of him. Not that his old staff was sad to hear that he had disappeared. Arriving at what looked like an ordinary IKEA, Chris parked his car outside. The place seemed deserted, no customers filing in and out of the front doors, the only other vehicles in the parking lot looking like they had just been abandoned by their owners. The manager scoffed to himself. These people running this store were going to teach him how to do his job? Indignantly, he clipped his name tag on and stepped out of his car, marching across the asphalt towards the entrance. The automatic doors gently slid open, shutting smoothly behind Chris as he stepped inside. The whole store was quiet, barely a peep from anywhere. The high ceiling of the IKEA store he so poorly managed carried a lot of noise and made any sound echo throughout the building. The squeaking of shoes against the vinyl floors, the bustle of customers, the electronic beep of cash registers, and the lull, dulled music played over the intercom. But there was none of that here. A deathly silence filled the aisles of flat pack furniture, display models of Hemnesses and Tricils standing as still and foreboding as gravestones. Suddenly, the sound of movement reverberated from between one row of aisles. Chris began marching towards its source, expecting to find an employee who would point him in the direction of the office where his training was supposed to be conducted. Sure enough, within a few steps, Chris spotted a figure in a familiar bright yellow t-shirt and blue pants, the same uniform his IKEA underlings wore at his store. Excuse me, he called as he strode towards the employee, shoes clomping against the floor with every step. You need to tell me where your manager is. I'm from the store across town, here for some pointless training seminar. Chris hadn't waited until he was close enough to engage in pleasant conversation, instead making his demands as he approached. The figure in the IKEA uniform, however, didn't turn to face him. Hey, I'm talking to you, Chris shouted. You deaf or something? There was a pause, telling Chris that what happened next wasn't in response to what he said, although that didn't make it any less frightening. The figure, who had been hunched over near the floor, suddenly drew itself up to its full height. It towered over Chris. It must have measured close to seven whole feet. As it turned, the malignant manager saw its face, or that it didn't have one. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but a smooth surface without any discernible features. Its arms were elongated, huge claw-like hands hanging down to the creature's knees. Being a coward, Chris turned and ran immediately. Confrontation was another area his employees had noticed he was sorely lacking in. Whenever faced with a rude and cantankerous customer, Chris would never defend his colleagues or their actions. Instead, he would suck up and brown nose to customers who were clearly in the wrong, essentially rolling over the minute anyone raised their voice. So now, confronted with a lumbering, faceless entity, his self-preservation instincts were kicked into overdrive, and he raced deeper into the store. Not exactly in the best shape, he slowed to a halt, wheezing as he tried to catch his breath. That was when, looking around, Chris noticed just how long the aisle seemed. He was sure he would still be able to see the front door from here, yet couldn't spot the entrance anywhere from where he was currently standing, panting like a thirsty dog. He looked over his shoulder. There was no sign of the staff member he'd encountered. Little did Chris know that it had lumbered off in the opposite direction the second he had run away from it, hardly paying him any mind, at least while the lights were still on. Unable to find the entrance or even a fire door he couldn't escape through, it didn't take long for the lights inside the infinite IKEA to dim. 
marking the start of the night cycle. Something about it being darker made the sounds of shuffling even more noticeable. There were more than one of those faceless, uniformed creatures. Trembling Chris climbed inside a klepstad, a wardrobe with a sliding door. Barely able to sleep with his knees tucked up under his chin, he spent the entire night inside the cramped, confined space. Every sound of movement from outside brought with it the mental image of one of the staff sliding open the outer door and reaching down to grab him. The whole sleepless while, Chris couldn't help but think about what he could have possibly done to deserve this cruel fate. The next morning, the lights came back on and started to bleed through the seams of the flat pack wardrobe, waking Chris from what little restless sleep he had gotten. He paused, unsure if he should venture out in case he came across another one of the staff. Suddenly, he heard the sound of voices, muted and muffled by the door of the Klepstad, but definitely real human voices. Had it all been some horrible nightmare? Had he fallen asleep at work and been stuffed into a wardrobe by his ungrateful employees? Oh, now he had them. He would sue every last one of them out of their jobs. Sliding the door open and tumbling out of the Klepstad, Chris found himself flying face down on the store floor, his legs too cramped to move. Just as he tried to will them into moving again, a voice called out to him. Hey, mister, it said. You okay there? A trio of footsteps raced over to where he was, and before he could get a good look at who they belonged to, hands were pulling Chris up off the floor. He looked at his rescuers, bemused to see other people in this endless void of affordable homeware. They were two men and a woman, each in disheveled clothing that looked like they had been wearing the same thing for years. Easy there, fella, one of the men spoke. Name's Buster. Which settlement you from? Why, what do you mean by settlement? Chris asked, confused. Looks like we got another newbie, the woman chuckled dryly. When'd you get here? Ah, uh, yesterday, I think, the former manager answered. Time can be a bit screwy in here, the second man chimed in. I'm Nolan. This here is Janine. You got a name? Uh, Chris, he nodded. You hungry, Chris? The three survivors led Chris through the winding expanse of the Ikea without an end, navigating the identical aisles with the expertise of people that had been here long enough to know their way around. In what felt like the tiniest fraction of the time that he had been lost the day before, they brought Chris to the food court. It was bustling with activity, more so than the one at his store, with people patiently lining up to take their fill of food from the Ikea menu. After joining the queue, Buster returned and handed Chris a plate of Swedish meatballs with mashed potato, peas, cream sauce, and lingonberry jam. So pleased to see food again, Chris began to gluttonously devour the whole plate while the others explained some of what was going on here, although he was barely listening. According to Janine, who had been there the longest, the inside of this Ikea was like an endless maze. There was no clear way out, even when retracing steps back the way one first entered. Nolan then weighed in and explained that there were pockets of people who had survived this long inside SCP-3008 by forming their own little communities. Thanks to the sheer amount of space within the store, these settlements were almost the size of small townships, built using whatever furniture, appliances, and other materials the other survivors had been able to scrounge up. How come you don't run out of food? Chris interjected. It replenishes every day, man, Buster replied, gesturing to the food court around them. Sure, it's not ideal if you aren't a huge fan of Ikea food, but you get used to it. Could be worse, all things considered. Then what the hell do you all do for money? The stubborn manager demanded. Look around you, Janine scoffed. We don't need it in here, we're cut off from the rest of the world. Stuff like money hardly makes a difference. Can't get us home or keep us fed, so what's the point? Chris sighed. Evidently frustrated at the prospect of living inside an Ikea, yet not having the opportunity for monetary gain. So, who's in charge? He asked. Who runs this place? Well, no one, Nolan shrugged. Settlements all work together, help each other out if needed, but we don't have any singular person running things. Hearing that out loud caused a twisted idea to form in Chris's balding head. Asking to be escorted by Buster to the right aisle, he started gathering up what he needed to make a rudimentary crown. What's that for? Buster asked, a little concerned about what Chris was planning. Oh, you wouldn't understand, he replied, not looking up from applying hot glue. Don't worry, I'll explain it in nice, simple terms when I'm ready. That night, despite being welcomed into the trio's town of Lighting with open arms, Chris slipped back to the food court while the other settlers were sleeping. Carefully, he avoided the lurking staff and their drone calls of, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Reaching his destination, the malicious manager lay in wait for the next morning, 
hiding out underneath the counter where the food was served. The next morning, the collected survivors of the infinite Ikea were met with an unfamiliar sight as they approached the food court. All the food had gone. It had still replenished overnight like it usually did, but someone had gathered it up before anyone had a chance to eat. Stood atop the counter with a smug look on his face, Chris made a show of placing his crown over his head. Morning, everyone, he announced. From today, things are going to be a little different around here, but I'm sure we'll be able to work together like one big happy family. Holding the gathered SCP-3008 residents as his literal captive audience, all of them hungry and irritable, Chris outlined what he had determined to be the best system possible for how things should be run inside the Endless Store. I will keep all the food secure and safe, and we're gonna start rationing it out, he explained. What for? A voice shouted from the crowd. It reappears every night anyway. Well, here's what we're gonna do. If you just shut up and let me finish, Chris replied calmly, but with a condescending tone of superiority. According to Chris's grand scheme, every day each settlement would be allocated what he deemed to be an acceptable amount of rationed food to feed its population of survivors. Then he made an offer to anyone who was willing to help him. If someone provided their services in collecting the food each morning and distributing the rationed amount, then Chris would allow them to take an extra portion of rations just for themselves. You see now? He asked the crowd, oblivious to how many of them were scowling at him. Anyone that wants to help, they get rewarded with a little bit extra. Call it a bonus. What if we don't want to help you? Another onlooker called. Well, that's fine by me, Chris sneered back. More for those who want it. I think what they mean is, Janine shouted from the group, what if we don't want you to implement this ridiculous system at all? What's to stop us from just taking the food we need every morning like we did before you showed up? Typical, he tutted. How lazy. You just want the privilege of having more, and you should work to earn it. And as for your silly little notion of just taking, I'm going to be here every morning. I'll get to decide who eats and who doesn't, and how much they deserve. And if anyone wants to take more than they deserve without offering their help in return, then they'll get half of the rations they would get, and so will their settlement. So, with those queries out of the way, allow me to introduce myself as your new store manager. When they recovered Chris's body outside of the entrance to SCP-3008, the Foundation had no way of knowing exactly who had beaten him up so badly. The other survivors inside the infinite Ikea might have done it themselves, while overthrowing his short-lived stint as manager. Or they might have decided not to lower themselves to that level, and instead shunned him from entering their settlements, leaving him to fend for himself. With the staff around every corner and their history of turning aggressive towards humans come nightfall, Chris's chances of survival were slim. The only real clue was the note that had been found with him which read, You can have him back. We don't want him. Adapting to sudden and unexpected changes is a core tenet of human survival. However, abruptly finding yourself trapped in an apparently infinite extra-dimensional pocket dimension in the form of a never-ending IKEA, well, that can take a brief adjustment period to get used to. Callan hadn't even noticed for the first few moments wandering through the aisles, aimlessly passing aisles of hemnas and trisils, all the assembled display pieces of affordable flatback furniture, it would have been more exciting, shopping for all the accoutrements for his brand new apartment, if Callan wasn't being perpetually reminded that he was moving in there on his own. It took him almost 20 minutes of walking through the row of IKEA products for him to realize something felt off. He had hardly seen anybody else around. In fact, the more he thought about it, there hadn't even been any employees in their garish yellow polo shirts and blue pants at the front of the store. Squinting off in the distance, Callan couldn't even see the far wall of the store. Sure, he knew IKEA outlets were big inside, somewhere between a supermarket and an industrial warehouse, but this place seemed to go on forever. Figuring that he had unknowingly stumbled out of the store proper and into a large storage area, Callan turned around and started to try to retrace his steps back to the entrance. It was after another 20 minutes of taking this approach that things went from feeling off to being overtly unsettling. By the time that over an hour had passed, Callan was starting to panic, racing through the seemingly unending store, the rubber soles of his sneakers squeaking against the epoxy resin floor as he yelled loudly for somebody, anybody, that might hear him. Before long, the latest victim to find themselves lost inside SCP-3008 was hitting the first existential hurdle that came with being trapped in the infinite IKEA. Callan sat on a display couch, a two-seated Soderham with a Shea lounge, in case anyone was wondering. 
He was curled up into a ball, knees tucked under his chin, as he gently started rocking himself back and forth in a futile attempt to comfort himself. It hadn't yet quite sunk in just how trapped he was, the thought that he might starve to death amongst the endless stock of Sores and Fjartigs. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. The sudden sound of a voice startled Callan, snapping him out of his dread-filled daydream enough to realize the store now seemed darker. The lights had been gradually dimming the longer he had stayed, creating an artificial night within SCP-3008. Normally the sign of another person after being isolated would come as a relief, but whoever had spoken was nowhere to be seen. A slow shuffling moved around the sofa Callan was sitting on, until he finally called out into the dark. Hello? Is anyone there? There was a pause. The movement stopped for an agonizingly quiet moment. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. The voice repeated as the unseen speaker stepped out of the shadows. Even in the low light, the creature was horrifying. Everything about it was just wrong. For a split second, Callan thought it might be an IKEA employee. It was wearing the uniform after all but the bodily proportions were all off, arms hanging nearly all the way down to the floor, hands and fingers enlarged and elongated. As for its face, it didn't have one. The ordinary features were all missing, and now it was running right for him. Callan leaped over the back of the Soderheim and ran. His first instinct was to get away and hide. Checking over his shoulder, he caught sight of the faceless creature dashing right past the couch with enough force to knock it over. In his startled state, looking out of the corner of his eye at the encroaching staff member, Callan tripped over his feet and tumbled back down to the hard floor. The creature loomed over him as he tried to crawl towards a nearby aisle. Looking up at it, the staff member was reaching for him, its big, disproportionate hand outstretched trying to grab at Callan as he lay there helplessly. Suddenly, something struck the faceless creature. Someone barely visible in the dim lights of the store had leaped down from the shelves of the aisle and swung a makeshift weapon at the staff member. As it connected, the creature reeled, stumbling over itself, long enough for the mystery assailant to take another swipe at it. Their weapon, comprised of what looked like part of a curtain rail with a pair of kitchen knives at one end, impaled the staff member, ripping through its bright yellow Ikea polo and out on the other side. Striding over to where Callan was still laying on the floor, awestruck by the display he just witnessed, the figure pulled back the hood of a rudimentary cloak they were wearing, fashioned by hand out of an Aina curtain fabric. Revealing herself with a stern, serious look on her face, the woman reached a hand out to Callan, offering to help him up, rather than whatever that faceless creature had wanted with him. It's okay, I'm not gonna hurt you, she stated as she pulled him back to his feet. This is probably all pretty confusing for you, right? Still too stunned to speak, Callan just nodded. Yeah, it was for me too, the woman replied. We don't have long until more staff show up, so you need to come with me and don't ask questions, okay? Seeing him nod again, she took Callan's head and led him through the dark recesses of the infinite Ikea. Stealthily, the pair of them snuck through the aisles keeping low and ducking down out of sight whenever more of the staff lumbered into their path until they had wandered elsewhere, clearing the way for them to proceed. Callan's new guide seemed to instinctively know her way around the layout of the sprawling maze of flat-packed Swedish furniture, quietly urging him to stay close, offering him a hand up when they climbed up shelving units, until finally they arrived at their destination. A warm glow emanated from somewhere beyond a tall, makeshift barrier. Sofas and cabinets were stacked on top of each other, forming an intricate wall around an area of SCP-3008. And right in the middle of this rudimentary barricade was a large two-door Pax Fardel wardrobe, its back missing, doors inwards, facing towards the inner side of the blockade. The guide stepped into the incomplete wardrobe and gave a specifically timed knock, three beats, with the third following the first two after a short pause. From the other side, it sounded like something was being hurriedly removed from the wardrobe's handles before the doors opened up to allow her and Callan entry. Beyond the outer wall, this part of the infinite Ikea looked to have been converted into a small town, with a sign hanging above that read, Decoration, Population 58. There were even more people within, most in handmade clothing crafted out of scraps of fabric, along with the remnants of old clothes from the outside world they'd been cut off from. Some looked like they were standing on guard, carrying weapons similar to the guide's weapon. Others were sitting around together, talking casually under the light of the Solifetta floor lamps. Okay, 
The guide sighed, turning back to Callan. We're safe now that we're inside the wall, so you can talk again now. Ah, uh, thank you, he replied awkwardly. For saving me, I mean. Don't mention it. She smiled for the first time since they had met. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions, so ask away. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Where am... Callan's voice trailed off, thinking of a question he wanted to know the answer to even more than where he was or what was up with this place. Who are you? The girl smiled and offered him an outstretched hand. My name's Kia. Over the coming months and with a lot of direction from his new friend, Callan slowly started to adjusting to living inside SCP-3008. The lifestyle was completely different from what he was used to before. Instead of renting or buying a house or apartment, the survivors had established their own little settlements, using the copious amounts of IKEA furniture around to construct homes for themselves. Without access to money or any need for it, nobody was self-serving either. Everyone chipped in and helped each other out agreed to take on tasks that would benefit their fellow survivors. There was a strong sense of community inside. All anyone had in the infinite Ikea was each other. They were all in the same situation, and surviving it was made easier by cooperating. Kia took responsibility for showing Callan around, teaching him all about life inside SCP-3008. When he asked her why she was so adamant about keeping an eye on him, she replied by telling him that when she arrived, she'd been scared and alone. Even when the Town of Decoration had taken her in, Kia still needed to learn all the basics on her own. She admitted that she wished somebody was there to teach her, and endeavored to do exactly that for Callan. She started by telling him what the best time to head to the food court was. Every day, all the food in SCP-3008 would somehow reappear, meaning that everyone could easily have their fill and survive without having to hunt or kill each other in order to eat. Kia's next lesson involved teaching Callum how to use IKEA stationery to leave subtle but recognizable symbols around the store, so that if he was ever lost, he could find his way back to decoration safely while avoiding the staff. That's the thing about living here, she said. When we first arrived, we all think we've got nothing, but this place has food, shelter, tools, everything we need. We just have to learn to use what it gives us. As time went on, Callum found himself paired up with Kia for patrols. During the daytime, staff would wander aimlessly around the store, far more docile than they were at night. To make sure that they were ready in the event of an attack by the faceless creatures, the survivors mapped out the staff's movements, reporting back to their settlements in case a large group of them were wandering too close. The more they went out together, the more Callan found himself eagerly looking forward to being in Kia's company. Maybe it was just because she was the first person he'd met inside the infinite Ikea, perhaps because she had saved his life, but there was something about her that made him feel a little less sad about being trapped here, a feeling that would soon be cruelly ripped away. It happened during an otherwise normal patrol. Kia and Callan were checking the aisles, keeping an eye on the staff, and tallying every one they saw. The lights were starting to dim, indicating that it would soon be night again, and the pair of them agreed it was time to start heading back to decoration. That was, until a sudden screeching caught their attention. What the hell was that? Callan whispered. No idea, Kia replied. Could be someone else just arrived. She gave a hand signal that instructed Callan to split up. The pair of them moved through parallel aisles towards the source of the noise. It sounded like stone scraping against the floor, the weight of concrete causing whatever was being moved to generate a grating, eardrum-piercing racket. As he moved silently through the now familiar space of SCP-3008, Kellen racked his brain about what could be making a noise like that. There was nothing that heavy or made of stone within Ikea, at least not that he had encountered. Even Kia had looked surprised when first detecting that sound. She'd been in here for so much longer, so it was telling when even she had no clue what had made it. Suddenly, the noise stopped quickly as it had started, followed by the call of a familiar voice. Callan, come look at this, Kia called. What is it? He shouted back, trying to keep his voice low but audible, aware that staff might be nearby. I don't know, some kind of statue. I've never seen anything like this in here before. Kia was cut off mid-sentence, a quick, loud scrape of concrete against the resin floor, followed by a blood-curdling scream. Eyes widening in horror, worried for her safety, Callan sprinted further down the aisle, frantically calling Kia's name. As he reached the nearest corner, the scream stopped. Her cries didn't fade, lowering gradually then petering off. Instead, her voice just cut out abruptly with a sickening muffled crack, like the sound of bone breaking beneath the skin. Panting, Callan whipped around the corner, 
That's when he saw her, lying on the floor, totally unnervingly still. Her head was tilted at an unnatural angle, the bones of her neck misaligned as blood dripped from her nose. Kia's body was lying at the feet of something Callan had never seen since he arrived at the infinite Ikea. It was some kind of sculpture, constructed out of concrete over a metal rebar skeleton, with a crude attempt at spray paint over its outer surface. He had no idea that this statue was often referred to as SCP-173, otherwise known simply as the sculpture. But then Callan was more focused on how distraught he felt at seeing Kia dead on the floor. He had never worked up enough courage to tell her, always worried that it would make things weird between them. And now he'd never get the chance again, would never get to see her smile as he took on the lessons that she taught him about surviving an SCP-3008. Feeling his eyes well up, Callan blinked away tears. Suddenly, the sculpture shot forward in the split second that his eyes were closed. Callan staggered away in shock and stumbled over, landing on his back on the floor. As he went to get up, SCP-3008 was inches away from him, having moved yet again of its own accord. Carefully, Callan stood up, making sure to keep looking straight at the sinister statue. It was getting clear what this thing was doing, that it couldn't move while being observed. Sure enough, as he started to cautiously back away one step at a time, SCP-173 stayed still, frozen in place. Reaching the corner, his eyes stinging, desperate to blink, Callan took a deep breath, fixing his gaze on the sculpture for one moment longer until, turning and sprinting as fast as his legs would allow, Callan had a few short moments to blink, sending his tears streaming down his face. Behind him, he could hear the same oncoming sound of concrete scraping heavily against the floor as the sculpture gave chase. Callan rushed down the aisles, grabbing stacks of flat packs off the store shelves and pulling them onto the floor, leaving piles upon piles of mess behind him in a desperate attempt to slow the oncoming statue down. Why hadn't it killed him already? Perhaps it was just playing with its food. He thought about trying to get back to decoration, wondering if maybe any of the other surviving settlers had encountered SCP-173 before. But as he ran, Callan caught sight of some of the symbols he and Kia had left around the store to help them find their way around. One of them denoted that there were hiding spots nearby and spurred him on to change course in that direction. He couldn't lead the sculpture back to town, not if it could slaughter them all in the blink of an eye. Finding a cramped cupboard, Callan climbed inside and shut the door behind him. With his knees tucked under his chin, he couldn't help but remember the time he had arrived in the infinite Ikea. He had done almost the exact same thing when he first encountered a staff member. He'd run, and his first instinct had been just to run away and hide. That was something about Kia he had always wished he could be. She was fearless, easily standing up to that staff creature that would have killed Callan if she hadn't intervened. Trapped inside a cupboard, the deafening noise of scraping concrete outside as the sculpture searched for him. Callan felt like he'd let her down. It seemed that despite Kia's best efforts to teach him, he was still scared. As he sat in the dark praying the sculpture wouldn't find him, he apologized under his breath to her. Callan started replaying every moment he and Kia had spent together, partly to keep her alive in his memory, but also so that he could at least think of something good before SCP-173 found him and broke his neck the same way. Every lesson about life in SCP-3008, every one of Kia's skills she had painstakingly passed on were still all there, including the best piece of advice she'd ever given. We have to learn to use what this place gives us. Her words echoed in his head as Callan finally realized that she hadn't just been talking about taking food from the food court or using flat packs to build shelters and settlements. She'd shown him how to navigate, how to evade the staff, and that everything in the infinite Ikea could have some usefulness in aiding survival. As much as it hurt knowing Kia was gone, Callan realized that she might have already saved him a second time. He peeked out of the cupboard door. The bathroom section was just a quick dash away, and SCP-173 was nowhere to be seen. A few moments later, the sculpture detected a loud sound, someone knocking things together. Shouting and whooping had caught its attention. Unobserved, the concrete creature zapped its way towards the source of the commotion, moving quickly over towards the bathroom department of the store's endless aisles. It came to a sudden, instinctive stop, sensing eyes were watching it. Its entire stone body froze, rigidly fixed to the spot it was standing on. It didn't matter that the eyes watching it this time were its own. Reflected back at itself in an assortment of mirrors, 
SCP-173 was stuck. Someone had sprung a trap for the statue, making it so that from the moment it shot over to its current position, it wouldn't be able to move. It was constantly being observed by itself, no matter what angle its reflection would be within its own direct line of sight. Standing atop a nearby stack of shelves, Calvin looked down at the concrete statue, trapped in a collection of mirrors that he had assorted into a ring. Hey you! He called down at it, hoping it could hear him, even though it was frozen in place. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. He struck loudly against the metal frame of the shelves, hoping it was loud enough to be heard. Sure enough, the staff quickly descended on the source of the noise. The night made the staff feral, hostile towards anything they sensed to be an outside presence. They instantly honed in on SCP-173, attacking it to little avail thanks to its stone body. Eventually, the group of staff grew in number, starting to heave the sculpture as they went to remove it from the premises. Climbing from shelf to shelf, Callan followed them the entire way. The staff had no eyes, so technically couldn't look at SCP-173, but he could. Even through tears, he didn't blink until the sculpture had been removed. He wanted to make sure it was what Kia would have done. Over the years, a considerable number of innocent people had unknowingly wandered into SCP-3008. Otherwise known as the Infinite Ikea, this extra-dimensional space more than lived up to its nickname, consisting of an Ikea store with no known limit to its endless aisles upon aisles of flat-packed Swedish furniture. But given the veritable labyrinth contained beyond the seemingly ordinary automatic doors of SCP-3008's entrance, it was rare that anyone making their way inside ever made it back out alive. On top of that, there was little the Foundation could do to ensure the safe return of anybody unlucky enough to find themselves lost in the infinite Ikea. Once inside, navigating a way out was made almost impossible given the scope of the spatially anomalous store. And then, of course, there was the staff. These tall humanoid creatures roamed the aisles of SCP-3008, sporting a lack of facial features, disproportionate bodies, and wearing the typical uniform of an average IKEA worker. I think it's becoming a concern, researcher Conley declared. No, a problem. Just how many people are going missing in SCP-3008. What else can we do? Her colleague researcher Kylan replied, shrugging their shoulders. We keep watch over the entrance and stop anyone from entering. But ours isn't the only entrance, Conley retorted. It was true. Based on evidence gathered from some survivors that had made it out of the infinite Ikea, the entrance seemed to exist in multiple parallel universes. Say we could figure out not just a way to navigate through SCP-3008 with better accuracy so people can make it back out, but what if, what if we could use it? Kylan jumped in, finishing the sentence. It could be like an interdimensional spaghetti junction, a hub to access all sorts of other alternate universes. We could send people through the entrance in our universe and they could make their way through 3008 and out into another. Exactly, their fellow researcher smiled. One problem though, they said. What do we do about the staff? The inhabitants of the infinite Ikea were undoubtedly an obstacle standing in the path of Conley and Kylan's idea. The faceless creatures were known to be docile during the daytime cycle within SCP-3008, only to turn violent and attack anyone present when the lights dimmed. They're part of the problem, Conley mused, but what if they could be part of the solution? The SCP Foundation hadn't had much chance to examine a live instance of a staff member, known as SCP-3008-2s up close. As such, they had a limited understanding of exactly what these creatures truly were, beyond the few they had witnessed chasing survivors out of the entrance. Were they intelligent? They were apparently able to speak, if only uttering the phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Did they have the capacity for independent thought, free will, and emotionality? There was only one way to find out. And so Conley presented her plan to capture a member of SCP-3008 staff for closer examination, not knowing the bizarre chain of events that would unfold as a result. Drawing it out was the easy part of the plan. After all, the Foundation knew that SCP-3008-2s were able to react to the presence of human beings within the infinite Ikea. So, Conley proposed sending in a single member of D-Class personnel with a line of cable attached to them, tethering them to just outside the entrance of 3008. They were like the bait on the end of an interdimensional fishing line and would hopefully catch the attention of a staff member and lure them out. What do we do once it's out? Kylan had mused. 
I mean, we know so little about their biology. We could use knockout gas, but what if they don't breathe? We could tranquilize it, but what if they don't have blood? It had been the one hitch in Conley's plan. Although she had suggested they use pure force, trapping the staff member like a wild animal before bringing it back. And sure enough, as an instance of SCP-3008-2 came racing out of the infinite Ikea, hot on the heels of the D-Class, Foundation security officers were able to swoop in and capture the creature, restraining it and bundling it into a transport back to the site. However, upon receiving their captive staff member, Kylan and Connolly were faced with a new problem. The creature seemed to be in its passive state. It didn't seem to be aggressive while away from SCP-3008. Kylan had posited their theory that the staff's attack state was linked somehow to the day and night cycles within the infinite Ikea, and now separated from that space, the SCP-3008-2 would remain docile, but the larger issue was communicating with it. As patient as Connolly tried to be with the faceless, mouthless humanoid, it seemed to be totally unresponsive to verbal communication. Any question she or her colleague Kylan asked the staff member, it offered no response. Dialing it back to more basic methods of communication, it didn't react when presented with symbols, unfazed by letters or numbers, or even straightforward pictograms. No matter what they tried, the staff member they had captured seemed not unwilling, but unable to respond. Oh, there's gotta be something we haven't tried, Conley urged, her frustration building after a long day of trying to get through to the creature. They're capable of speech, we know that from witness reports. Well, maybe they're a hive mind, Kylan mused, equally exhausted after their efforts. What if it shares a consciousness with the other staff? Like a drone in an ant colony. Hey, that's what we should name this one, they added. D for drone. Can we focus here, please? Researcher Conley snapped. It's almost like we need some way of enhancing it, granting it the right higher brain function so it has the ability to speak with us. Hold up, her colleague replied. You said we need a way to enhance it, but what if we refined it? What Kylan was insinuating was obvious, albeit a direct violation of the Foundation's own rules. SCP-914, otherwise known as the Clockworks, was an anomalous contraption of unknown origin. Two booths connected to the machine, one labeled input and the other output, could be used to disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy an object that was placed within SCP-914. Although there was yet again another hurdle Conley and Kylan would have to attempt jumping over. The Foundation had banned the use of the clockworks on biological organisms. The pair submitted a request to their Foundation superiors for access to 914 and permission to use it on D. Kylan hadn't expected their suggestion to be met with anything short of a resounding no, and while determined, Conley couldn't help but find herself worrying about the possible, highly likely rejection, which made it all the more surprising that their request was not only granted, but the experiment approved by the O5 Council themselves. Clearly, the highest operational staff within the Foundation had some keen interest in whether the Clockworks could refine an SCP-3008 staff member. More likely, their interest was in what benefit the experiment could potentially lead to. If the Foundation possessed a refined staff member, its own agent within the Infinite Ikea, the possibilities could be of great advantage to the O5 Council. They were less concerned with having an intermediary, using D to communicate with the other SCP-3008-2s, or negotiating the potential release of the displaced innocent people lost inside the infinite Ikea. If refining D could mean the Council had a way to safely reach other alternate universes by traversing through SCP-3008, then that bridge between worlds would be theirs to control. Of course, Kylan and Connolly were more interested in what Refining D could tell them about the staff and the nature of SCP-3008. Did instances of SCP-3008-2 have needs or wants? Could they even possess the capacity to want things? Were they fulfilled with their lives as anomalous IKEA workers? And how did they navigate the maze of endless aisles? Imagine it, Conley theorized. If D can communicate with them for us, we could open up trade with them. The canteen inside SCP-3008 endlessly refills with food. Just picture what this could mean if we work out a system of distributing that resource out of the IKEA. It could change the world, she exclaimed excitedly. Only one way to find out, right? Kylan replied. They watched as D, their captive staff member, was nudged into the input booth of SCP-914. Conley gave the research assistants a signal to activate the clockworks, hoping that refining D would allow them to be capable of speech and free thought. However, either through miscommunication or a secret order from above, one of the assistants had incorrectly calibrated SCP-914. 
It was meant to be set to fine, which would improve whatever was placed in the machine, but instead the dial had been turned to very fine, which improved the target item to an ever greater extent, often granting it anomalous properties. Before anyone even noticed the change, the gears and gyros of SCP-914 clicked and whirred into life, making a raucous noise of moving mechanical parts. Destroyed in the input booth, only to be reconstituted into something altogether new in the output one opposite, de-emerged from SCP-914 after the process was complete. Its clothing seemed to have experienced the most noticeable change. Instead of being the usual yellow shirt and blue trousers IKEA uniform worn by the rest of the staff, D was now sporting the same clothes, but the colors seemed to be shifting, almost like the natural camouflage of a chameleon. They were still faceless, their bodies still incorrectly proportioned compared with a human, and for the most part, D seemed unchanged. But before Kylan and Connolly could move in to take a closer look, before they were even able to check if D could speak, the staff member vanished in the blink of an eye. An instant state of panic erupted throughout the Foundation facility. Alarms were howling over a containment breach. Security teams were dashing through every wing of the site to track down D. Swept up in the chaos that quickly ensued, Conley and Kylan received another message from the highest point up the chain of command. Find that staff member and bring it in, alive, or there would be held to pay from the O5 Council. But somehow there was no sign of D anywhere in the facility. They had gone. Scans of the building revealed that all members of personnel, all anomalies and other registered forms of life were all accounted for. It was only when Kylan ran through the mess hall that they realized where their refined test subject had gone to. Hey, turn that up! They yelled to a security officer who had been quietly enjoying his lunch break. Standing on a chair, he reached up and raised the volume of a TV that was mounted to the wall overlooking the mess hall. The screen was depicting a live news report. The anchor on the ground standing outside the entrance to an ordinary IKEA store. I'm standing outside the very store where this bizarre turn of events have taken place, the anchor explained. Police received numerous calls regarding sightings of an unknown figure said to be scaring shoppers. However, they only responded when this clip went viral on social media. The report cut to cell phone footage of none other than D inside the store. Their uniform had shifted into its typical IKEA colors almost like it had adapted to suit the place it had somehow transported itself to. From the mess hall, Kylan watched the footage in a mix of shock and confusion. Naturally, the reaction from bystanders was one of fright at the individual's rather odd faceless appearance. Some took to Twitter, posting images calling it some form of viral marketing hoax. Others claimed it was a publicity stunt by IKEA to boost sales, although in a statement the company denies these accusations. However, it was then reported that the supposed creature began I'm reading this right, aren't I? The anchor paused for a moment. Started helping customers by directing them to store departments, recommending different IKEA furniture, and perhaps, strangest of all, did all this via, oh, come on, really? Telepathic communication. Conley had appeared in the mess hall just in time to witness the news. D had gotten free and immediately sought out the nearest IKEA to work there. The next few hours contained a maddening slew of new information bombarding the Foundation as researchers Kylan and Connolly scrambled to figure out some way of recapturing D. It didn't seem that the SCP-3008-2 instance was a danger to civilians. In fact, most reports stated that they were rather friendly. Any customers that interacted with the creature described its new communication patterns in five-star reviews they apparently felt compelled to start posting online. I've never experienced anything like it, one wrote. D offered the most delightful customer service I have ever received. That's why they must have gotten their name, D for Delightful. It's not like D speaks in your head, another review explained. It's more like they just give you their thoughts beamed directly in there. I said, where can I find the bathrooms and fittings department? And instantly D had given me the directions. It was as if I'd always known. Having an anomaly like D out in the open raised all sorts of problems for the Foundation. For one, they would not have to only scrub every mention of the staff member from the internet but also tracked down anyone that had interacted with D to administer amnestics. But that was far from the worst of it. The researchers had been so caught up in coordinating a recapture effort that they didn't realize how rapid and extremely widespread the D reviews were getting. They were being left on customer satisfaction boards for stores in different states within minutes of each other. It took only 15 minutes for a review that mentioned D to be left in a store that wasn't even an IKEA outlet, but a convenience store. Thank you, Dee, for such lovely and speedy service at the cashier's desk. Never had such a nice conversation and interaction with anyone else in the store before, the review read. 
The news that D could seemingly be in multiple places at once, appearing in different stores, was confirmed when Conley and Kylan saw photos posted online of the creature, wearing what looked like a number of alternate uniforms. It seemed that Dee's clothing, once exclusively just an Ikea shirt and pants, switched to match the uniform of whichever store they started to work in, and the more they worked, the more places they seemed to appear. Perhaps the most shocking development came almost 50 minutes after Dee had been refined and had disappeared. Once again turning their attention to the news, researcher Kylan watched as the manager of a huge supermarket franchise store appeared giving an interview live, talking about how the altered SCP-3008 staff had caused him to change his entire business practice. Listen, D is great. Our customers love D. I hear the company's shareholders love him too. One thing's clear, we all love D, he said jovially, but something was unnerving about his gleeful smile. So to show them our appreciation, I am hereby announcing that, effective immediately, all my retail staff are no longer required to come into work. D does it all, so there's no need for anyone else. They're friendlier, quieter, they work faster, and they're more efficient than any employee on my payroll. That's right, folks, D's here to stay. Naturally, this move sparks serious controversy, with the store's disgruntled now former employees finding themselves out of work. A number of them took to social media in an outcry of dissatisfaction. This isn't fair, I've worked every weekend through college at that store, and now I'm fired just like that? Thanks a lot, D, one of them protested. It's all a corporate ploy, another wrote. The rumor is that the only reason they're laying us all off so quick is because D doesn't technically count as a human employee, so they don't have to pay them. They're working for free, so the store manager and the company that owns the store can keep every penny of the profits. The justified outrage seemed to go willfully ignored as another store announced it would be adopting the same policy firing all its staff and letting D take over their duties. More and more photos started pouring in right before Conley and Kylan's eyes of multiple refined SCP-3008-2 instances working behind cashier's desks, refilling shelves with products, assisting customers. Dees seemed to be acting out of instinct, like they couldn't help being staff. It was their purpose. The horde of anomalous staff members ended up swarming over the country's retail industry simultaneously, like the drones of an ant colony. Kylan, what the hell have we done? Connolly asked, staring in disbelief at the TV screen. We've done the unthinkable, they answered, equally horrified. We created a monster. We took D out of SCP-3008 and made them into the most powerful retail worker on the planet. Within hours, every retail outlet of every different description, not just IKEA, had reported the firing of their entire staff, and every business that did was now raking in record profits. Droves of shoppers flocked to stores, all enjoying Dee's customer service so much that they were taking any excuse they could to rush out and buy, well, anything. As stock supplies started to deplete, more and more instances of the altered SCP-3008-2 appeared, taking over the supply chain and distributing products to the various stores they were working at, refilling the shelves in record time. Naturally, the O5 Council was furious. Researchers Kylan and Connolly had hoped to present them with a refined SCP-3008 staff member that could allow them to better understand the infinite IKEA. Now the Council's ulterior motive of having access to an interdimensional bridge of other universes had been dashed, as if that wasn't bad enough, and the added hassle of D rapidly becoming a worldwide sensation, the economy was destabilizing. Thanks to the retail companies firing their staff and hoarding massive amounts of profit from all their stores, and thanks to having D compulsively working there, refining an SCP-3008 staff member looked like it was about to collapse the stock market and plunge the whole world into chaos. Um, our bad? Researcher Kylan shrugged, unsure what to say after they and Connolly had just been brought before the shadowy O5 Council to be reprimanded. There was only one thing for it. D had to be taken out of the picture, and quickly. The more they worked, the more they seemed to be able to multiply and spread. Then, with a greater number of D instances within a store, the faster and more efficient they were able to work. So in retaliation, the O5 Council begrudgingly activated Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known by their codename, Red Right Hand. This task force reported directly to the Council. They were some of the Foundation's most loyal operatives, and it was far from their first assassination mission. Well, they had assumed it would be an assassination, dispatching the Red Right Hand to a nearby Ikea where D had first transported themselves to after exiting 914. Of course, the place was overrun with D duplicates, but even after clearing out the entire store and administering amnestics to any customers that witnessed it, there were still plenty more of D out there. 
The council quickly realized that they'd have to send MTF Alpha 1 to every branch of every outlet in the country, systematically taking out every duplicate of D in a lengthy cleanup operation until they were no more. It seemed the Foundation's personnel had their work cut out for them. Hopefully, they'd be entitled to a raise and some paid time off after all of this was over. Okay, this isn't good. I know you have no idea who I am, have no reason to care, but my lovely wife Brenda and I got ourselves into kind of a sticky situation here. We just wanted to go shopping, gosh darn it, and now we're trapped in here. I think there are monsters. Oh god, this is horrible. I'm so scared, not just for my life, but for hers. And worst of all, why does it feel so oddly familiar? Okay, okay. Gotta keep a cool head. How did this all begin? It had been about a year since the incident. Uh, we don't like to talk about it much. My psychiatrist tells me that after I was kidnapped by that mysterious international criminal organization and kept in their clutches for 100 days, it's likely I repressed most of the memories to avoid the trauma. He told me it's an extremely common reaction. So common, in fact, that even Brenda can't fully remember the exact circumstances of my kidnapping. Just her immense gratitude when the FBI brought me home. Eventually, we moved out of our old place. Too many dark spots. And into a new apartment in a different town in a different state. You know, things were good until one day we realized we didn't have a coffee table. Oh, who can live without a coffee table these days? So we decided to make our way to the local Ikea to buy a Toolstorp coffee table. Brenda wouldn't let me go alone. She never lets me out of her sight anymore since I was kidnapped. Neither of us had been to an Ikea in over a year, so naturally we found it easy to get lost in there. Those warehouses are confusing after all. But this time, it was different. We were lost for hours on end. We even started calling out for help, but we never got any reply. And after what must have been closing time, the overhead light shut off. Well, we were less than calm about it. As a day passed, the two of us stuck together. We watched enough Scooby-Doo cartoons in our youth to know that splitting up to cover more ground is the quickest way to get irreparably lost. That being said, it's not like sticking together did us any better. We kept wandering through the different departments, wondering if we passed that Lomar cabinet or that copying chest of drawers before. We walked until our legs ached, trying to stay strong for each other. It's impossible that we'd be trapped in here. Sure, I know that warehouses can be a little overcomplicated, but this is ridiculous. By the time the day ended, or at least by the time the store's lights turned off, we were able to find a slatum queen-size bed to rest for the night. Maybe we'll be able to find our way out tomorrow. How long have we been in here? I checked the date on my phone. 72 hours. Though of course there's no internet or cell service in here. Naturally, Brenda and I get up when the lights turn on and start walking again. Surely anyone who walks for long enough has to find something, right? We both hold this hope in our hearts as we pass what feels like miles of cheap, flat-packed display furniture, wondering what on earth is going on. Sometimes we see figures moving in the distance. Part of me can't help but wonder if they're really there or if I'm just losing my mind in here. Difficult to say. It feels hyperbolic to even express this thought, but there's something oddly frightening about the things I see out of the corner of my eye. I start to get the sense that we're not alone in this strange place. And frighteningly, I don't know if not being alone in here is really such a good thing. At least we have each other in here. Oh god, oh god, oh god, things just got a lot worse. So, Brenda and I were walking down one of the many lattice aisles of the kitchenware department when the lights shut off. Thankfully, we'd picked up a pair of Fryel rechargeable flashlights, so moving in the dark was no longer a deal breaker for us. Goody goody. Or at least that's what I thought, until we encountered something horrific in there. Look, Brenda said, pointing into the distance. It's a member of staff. I couldn't tell you why, but the second Brenda said that, a chill went down my spine. It was like the lingering after effects of some memory I couldn't recall. There was a silhouette in the distance, and in the beam of the flashlight, I could make out the faint colors of an IKEA staff member's uniform. I knew right there and then that it was time to get the hell out of there. But before I had a chance to say anything to Brenda, the so-called staff member had already closed the distance. It ran into the beam of our flashlights, its long, drooping arms and featureless face shining in the light. Instinctively, I threw myself into its path to protect Brenda. It forced me to the ground and began beating me with its fists, kept repeating in this kind of freakish, robotic voice. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. If Brenda hadn't smashed it over the head with a vat-not stainless steel kettle and beat it to a pulp on the ground, I would have been done for. So, now we know. There are monsters in here. Great. Food and water are becoming an issue. 
It's not something we've needed to address until now because of the healthy supply of snacks in Brenda's purse, but there's a hard limit to things like that. We realized we really needed to find food in this place or we'd be doomed. But after the encounter with that monster, we're moving cautiously. Who knows how many of them are still out there. We can't travel at night anymore. That'll keep us safe, but it won't do anything about our hunger situation. It's only a matter of time. Brenda's a genius. I don't know how I'd ever survive in this terrible place without her. I'd probably die on day one of my own. She remembered that no IKEA is complete without a little mini cafeteria where they serve a variety of Swedish dishes, including their famous IKEA meatballs. All we need to do in the otherwise sterile environment of the IKEA is follow the smell until we found our way to sweet, meaty salvation. And that's exactly what we did. Eventually, this plan bore fruit, and we found our way to the cafeteria. I'd never been so happy to see crappy furniture store food. We both grabbed a bowl full of meatballs, when suddenly, just before I could take a bite, I felt an overwhelming wave of nausea. Something about it felt so incredibly, unsettlingly familiar. What the hell was going on here? Another day, another near-death experience. Our hearts leaped up into our throats when we turned a corner and saw one of those faceless monsters just standing there in the next aisle. We were ready to either square up or run for the hills, but oddly, this time, it didn't even seem to register our presence. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, during the day, they didn't have the same aggressive nature to them. Huh. Curiouser and curiouser. Just like it said when it first attacked me, I think these things really only do attack when the store is closed. I guess that makes them lawful evil. God, I miss D&D. We're getting a little better at the whole freaky supernatural Ikea thing. Brenda figured if there are monsters out there, our best bet would be to arm up and protect ourselves. And hell, I'm not gonna disagree. We scavenged different parts of the store to make ourselves a mini Ikea armory, barred full meat tenderizers, Borda chef's knives with Borda meat cleavers from the same set. We also picked up some Fracta rope and tarpaulin, and a pair of stylish Vardlin's travel backpacks to carry all our new IKEA swag in, in addition to the food we've been keeping in the IKEA Pruda Tupperware packs. With the two of us together and all this equipment, I feel like we're ready for anything. In the following week, we discovered that we were not, in fact, ready for anything. While what we would later call the Eight Days of Hell started off rather pleasantly, the standard wandering, foraging, and sleeping, it ended in a no-holds-barred fight for our lives when the lights turned off unexpectedly while we were surrounded by maybe 20 members of demonic IKEA staff. Even with our weaponry, we couldn't fight many of them. Instead, we ran for our lives in the dark. That's when Brenda tripped over a carelessly discarded Lilalbo three-piece toy train set. I ran back to help her up, but they were already too close for us to make it out of there. Terrified, we hunkered down and waited to die in each other's arms. That's when a series of expertly placed gunshots rang out through the air, and the staff members collapsed onto the ground, each of their faceless heads perfectly perforated by a well-aimed bullet. We looked up to see the face of our savior, a strange man holding a rifle and a bulletproof vest grinning wildly. Come with me if you want to live, he said. And we did. So, we did. When we woke up the next morning after practically passing out from the stress, Brenda and I saw that we'd been shepherded into a miniature makeshift campsite by our mysterious well-armed Good Samaritan. He told us that his name was James, and he'd been trapped in what he referred to as the infinite Ikea for weeks now. Thankfully, he had his trusty rifle with him, or he probably would have been killed by the staff long before now. We decided, out of politeness, to not ask him why he'd brought a rifle and a bulletproof vest into Ikea in the first place. We were just happy to be alive. We even gave him a few of our tubs of meatballs as thanks for the daring assist. James told us that there were others trapped in here, some of which have even made full settlements. With his weaponry and our supplies, we might even have a good chance of finding others out there, forming a group and getting out. And that sounded like a great idea to Brenda and I, so we were more than happy to tag along. Over the next 21 days, we explored more of the infinite Ikea with James. It certainly felt safer with him around, being able to take on the staff at a distance rather than risk being overpowered and killed in a more traditional struggle. James is a really nice guy, if a little strange. During our 21-day period of searching for others, James killed a few different staff members during the night. For Brenda and I, killing off attacking staff members is a profound relief. But James, he seems to take an almost perverse pleasure in killing them. But we do what we can to overlook that fact. At the end of the day, even if he is a bit of a freaky gun nut, 
He's a valuable asset in a world like this. However, for days on end, our search for a camp was fruitless. There were supposedly a huge number of communities inside the infinite Ikea, which often have their own unique cultures and hierarchies. It was hard to believe that all of this was actually happening. Was James just making it up and taking us for a ride? But even if he was just crazy, what other options did that leave us? We just had to keep going, but nothing would prepare us for the kind of madness we were about to face. At some point during our journey, when we were still searching for one of the supposed outposts hidden in the depths of the Ikea, we were ambushed. But not by the staff. No, it was a collection of human beings wielding knives and dressed in the staff's clothes, wearing their hollowed out heads like masks. There were maybe 20 of them when they got the jump on us, surrounding us and neutralizing any advantage James's gun could have given us. These masked strangers identified themselves of a nomadic gang calling themselves the Sons of Vardaga. They'd come from an outpost that had since fallen, so at least we knew that James was right when he told us about the communities out there in the Ikea. And then something even stranger happened. One of the Sons of Vardigan pointed at me and said he recognized me. I said that was impossible and that I'd never seen him before in my life. He brandished his knife and started getting in my face, claiming I was lying. That's when Brenda stepped forward to defend me, telling him to step off. As wonderful as her intention was, this just made things worse. A few other members of the Sons of Vardigan began ganging up on her, and that I simply couldn't abide. Without even thinking, I threw an impulsive punch, laying out one of the goons. That turned all heads my way, and gave James an opportunity to take his chance. He turned his rifle towards some of them and opened fire, killing several of them and scattering the rest. Maybe we were better at this whole survival thing than we thought. Over the next couple of weeks, we continued our search, our confidence bolstered by our win against the Sons of Vardaman. We made occasional stops, searching out cafeterias to refuel our meatball supply. You need protein in the infinite Ikea. At some point during the journey, James asked Brenda and me a strange question. Have you ever heard of the SCP Foundation? Well, neither of us could answer that question. There was a strange, faint memory of that name. Was it some kind of charity? Maybe a government thing? I don't know. But something about it, just like so many other elements of this impossible situation, is eerily familiar to me. I just don't understand. I just don't get it. And it frightens me. 68 days into our confinement, we found something horrifying. One of the camps that James had alluded to earlier, or at least what was left of it. The walls were broken down, and the courtyard area of this makeshift community was littered with corpses. Brenda and I were horrified by the sight of what seemed like some kind of massacre. James just strode forward into the camp, observing the aftermath of some unknown carnage. Hmm. Looks like we got here too late, he said. Shame. A real shame. James advised us to collect any resources worth taking from the ransacked camp and moving on. No point crying over people we never even knew. But looking at the bodies, part of me felt as though I had known these people once, perhaps in another life. I got closer to one of these deja vu inducing bodies and noticed something strange. The body had gunshot wounds. Over the next four days, a nightmare erupted. After discovering the massacre at the camp, I came to realize that James couldn't be trusted. He was dangerous and unstable, and I had every reason to believe he was the one behind all those killings. I relayed these facts to Brenda and told her that we needed to get away from him as quickly as possible. But when we attempted to escape, he caught us and held us at gunpoint. He seemed intent on killing both of us. He was bigger, stronger, and better armed than the two of us, so all I could do was distract him and hope for an opportunity to turn the tables. I asked him who he really was and why he was here. So, figuring he had nothing to lose, he told us. Once upon a time, he had been a mobile task force operator, kind of a special ops guy for that SCP Foundation group. He'd been one of the best, but after he horrendously botched a mission, including intentionally murdering many civilians over the course of his career, you know, just for fun, he'd been demoted to D-Class, which, to the best of my knowledge, seems to be a human guinea pigs this SCP Foundation used for cruel experimentation. One of the experiments they used him for was apparently this very location, the Infinite Ikea. He'd been in here for a long time now, with guns and ammo he'd stolen from other Foundation operatives that had been trapped in here. In a sense, he loved it in here. He got to do his favorite thing of all, killing people with nothing to stop him. And now, he was going to do it to us. I hugged Brenda tight. I was sure this would be our last moments. James leveled the barrel of his rifle at us and prepared to fire. 
when two figures emerged from the darkness behind him wielding knives and hammers. It was a woman and a large man. They lunged at James and struck him again and again and again, until he collapsed to the ground, bleeding, dying, gone. These two people then looked up at me with a sense of recognition and amazement. And at that moment, I realized that I recognized them too. They were Vicky and Barry. I knew them. I I'd been here before. Over the next several days, it all came back to me. The hundred days I'd spent in the infinite Ikea before. Well, going on two hundred days now. The friends I'd made and lost. The strength I'd gained. I'd never been kidnapped. That had just been a cover story formulated by the same SCP Foundation that produced that gun-toting maniac James. Brenda was amazed to hear all this, and I was both amazed and delighted to see that Vicky and Barry had survived. We believed that Barry had died after leading the staff away from the encampment, but as it turns out, some people are just too badass to kill. My memories were hitting me like a high-pressure firehose now, washing away the cobwebs and giving me a kind of clarity that I hadn't known in an entire year. And in that glorious moment, I remembered I'd gotten out of here before. I could get us all out of here again. The route was somewhere inside me. I just needed to follow it. Day 200. I remembered somewhere deep down that I needed to keep moving. I led Brenda, Vicky, and Barry behind me. They trusted me, and their trust would be rewarded. Step after step, hour after hour, until eventually we arrived. Light filtered through the glass double doors. A smile spread across my face. Our breath quickened. Barry began to tear up. After all this time, we'd finally found our way out. We officially survived 200 days in Ikea. As we stepped closer, the automatic doors opened, as though it was congratulating us. We held hands and stepped out into the light together. Having your ordinary life unceremoniously change forever without a moment's notice is something that people can often find themselves hoping for. Anything to break life's monotony and change circumstances to make them more interesting. Although when that change comes in the form of being trapped in an endless IKEA outlet, it's not exactly the different kind of circumstances that people usually hope for. That was the situation that had befallen Winston not too long ago. What started as a simplistic, straightforward shopping trip with the goal of purchasing some affordable, stylish Swedish furniture had resulted in him having to adopt a completely different lifestyle. You see, Winston was one of the untold number of people to have an encounter with SCP-3008, better known colloquially as the Infinite IKEA. Appearing as an ordinary store, those entering the doors of SCP-3008 find themselves in an unending labyrinth of aisles upon aisles filled with flat-pack homeware. It can be quite the system shock, of course, especially when people that find themselves inside the infinite IKEA learn there's no way to escape, even by retracing their steps back the way they came. Doing so, they'll only be met with a disheartening realization that the entrance isn't where it was upon their arrival. Now at first, learning that you've lost your entire life and are doomed to spend the rest of your days inside a limitless IKEA is admittedly a lot to take in. Your friends, family, job, all your worldly possessions are now unreachable, and everyone back home might likely spend many years wondering what happened to you. But it's not all bad news. As previously mentioned, Winston wasn't the only one to find himself in this predicament. Over the years, countless people have found their way inside the infinite IKEA. Given how expansive the interior of the never-ending store was, there has never been a way to know for certain exactly how many people have come to reside within SCP-3008, but it's enough to populate the number of small settlements that these survivors have been able to establish inside. By innovatively repurposing the materials around them, these individuals have found themselves to be the new denizens of SCP-3008. Imagine whole towns constructed from chairs and tables that have been used as building materials to provide a place of sanctuary to those that need it when they first arrive in the infinite IKEA. Sure, it takes a pretty big adjustment to this new lifestyle, but luckily, SCP-3008 provides for its inhabitants by automatically replenishing the food within its canteen. Naturally, it only offers items that are on the IKEA menu, but that's at least a consistent source of food and nutrition for those dwelling in its aisles. With food already taken care of, people inside SCP-3008 didn't even need to work. That was the strangest part that Winston found himself having to adapt to when he first got to the settlement of cookware, 
named after the nearby sign that hung from the ceiling nearby, denoting one of the many departments of the store. It was odd to him how friendly everyone was, how much the people trapped inside 3008 cut off from the outside world forever seemed happy. There were many who'd been there for the longest that even claimed it was a better sense of life than out there in the real world. Inside the IKEA, there was a strong sense of community. Settlements helped each other out with construction, and because everything was provided for, no one had any need for selfishness or greed. After all, there was plenty of food to go around and money had no relevance. Ironic given they were all living inside a huge furniture store. Witnessing all of that helped Winston adapt to his new life inside SCP-3008 and made him feel a lot better about being in this predicament. The only real thing anyone inside the Infinite Ikea had to worry about was the threat of the staff. These were the tall, faceless humanoids with elongated arms and legs that roamed the aisles of the furniture store while wearing distinctive Ikea uniforms. Most of the time, they remained docile, paying the human survivors little attention. That is, until the fluorescent lights above dimmed, signaling the beginning of nighttime. The staff usually became aggressive, repeating the ominous phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building and attacking anyone they came into contact with. Thanks to their ingenuity, the survivors in the IKEA had constructed barriers around their settlements to keep the staff out, and that did the trick, repelling the faceless employees that come at night. But little did anyone inside SCP-3008 realize that simple barricades wouldn't stop an entirely new threat from entering the store to disrupt their peaceful way of life. For outside the infinite IKEA, Something wicked was stirring. Meanwhile, at a facility belonging to the SCP Foundation, a researcher by the name of Corbin Donnell had recently been assigned to SCP-035. Also known as the Possessive Mask, this white porcelain mask could shift between a comedy grin or a tragic frown. It also had the nasty trait of being an evil psychic artifact that could manipulate anyone around it into placing the mask over their face. At that point, SCP-035 would take full control of its wearer, making them into a host for the mask itself. So, would you like to take a guess as to what happened to Researcher Donnell? The voice in his head, that persuasive whisper, it wouldn't leave him alone. All day long, it was there, but whenever Corbin was near SCP-035, it got louder, and as the days he was studying the possessive mask went on, the whisper became a shout. The screams to put on the mask were taunting him, keeping him awake at night, tormenting him all through the waking day, until eventually he'd had enough. Given that SCP-035 produced a corrosive black substance that usually melted anything around it, the mask had to periodically be taken out of its containment case so that the container housing it could be replaced. And it was during one of these transfers that researcher Donnell calmly swept in, pushing away the guards taking it out of its melted case before they could place it in a new one. The aggression from the researcher caught the security personnel by surprise, as did what he did next. Not caring what the possessive mask would do to him, Corbin lifted the white porcelain to his face. He wasn't even aware that the containment breach alarms were sounding. All that noise sank into the background as the psychic voice in his head got louder than it ever had before. There wasn't even so much as a split-second awareness from Researcher Donnell of the searing pain as the dark sludge oozing from the mask made contact with his skin, melting his face as he wore SCP-035. By that point, it was already too late. The possessive mask had full control. Corbin's body wasn't his own anymore. Although it still moved, walking quickly out of the room and through the halls of the Foundation facility, the Researcher beneath was already dead. There was only SCP-035, piloting its newest host to freedom. Of course, while containment breach was still an urgent matter, the Foundation knew that SCP-035's biggest weakness was itself. The black secretion that poured out of the possessive mask would melt anything it came into contact with, and would ultimately cause the body of its host to melt into nothing. Once that happened, it would be far easier to recontain SCP-035. Someone would merely have to pick it up and place it back in the containment case. However, SCP-035 knew this, too. The mask itself was cunning. It hadn't just picked Researcher Donnell at random to be its new vehicle. 
It wanted him specifically because of his previous posting. Before he had worked with SCP-035, Corbin had been stationed to observe any potential changes at the entrance of SCP-3008. As it stayed firmly on the researcher's face, using him to carry itself out of the Foundation site it had been trapped in, SCP-035 was scouring the remnants of Corbin's mind. It used its innate psychic abilities to plunder the depths of his brain, looking for information. The location of SCP-3008 was right there, stored away safely in researcher Donnell's memories, as was the way to get there. And on top of that, the reason SCP-035 had taken such an interest in making it to the infinite IKEA. During the Foundation's many years of study and exploration of SCP-3008, they came to learn that not all of the survivors inside the infinite IKEA had originated from the same universe. The current theory was that the entrances to this endless furniture store existed simultaneously in multiple realities, meaning that the people now living alongside each other inside SCP-3008 were actually from varying different worlds across the multiverse. Now, if you were incredibly cunning, incredibly clever, and incredibly sick of being held captive by the Foundation, then perhaps you could figure out a way to navigate your way through the infinite IKEA. You could enter through the front door in one universe, and then exit into another. And of course, that was what the Possessive Mask was planning to do. As it approached the main entrance of SCP-3008, the black sludge leaking out of the mask had almost destroyed what was left of researcher Corbin Donnell. It wiped more of the corrosive secretion onto the guards stationed at the infinite IKEA, melting through them as SCP-035 made its way inside. First things first, the mask knew it had to find itself a new body to pilot before Corbin's expired. And it didn't take long for the possessive mask to happen across an unwitting candidate between the aisles of flat pack tables. At around the same time this was happening, Winston, having long since gotten used to the rhythm of life inside SCP-3008, was on his way to the food court. He knew the route by heart now, and as he strolled closer, he was pondering over what he'd help himself to today from the menu. But it was while making his way there that he noticed something, or rather, he noticed not something, that he usually did. There were no staff anywhere around. Although they did not pay the survivors any mind during the day, when the lights of the IKEA were on, Winston knew that the staff members were always present. There were usually a couple milling about the aisles he had to pass in order to get from the settlement of cookware to the food hall, but today, there were none. And while this wouldn't usually be any cause for alarm, it kept playing on Winston's mind as he sat down to eat his plate of Swedish meatballs. He'd been inside SCP-3008 for such a long time that he'd become accustomed to the routine of living there, and the absence of the staff immediately stuck out as something that was out of its usual place. Finishing his food, Winston asked around, talking with his fellow residents of the infinite IKEA, asking if any of them had encountered any of the tall, faceless staff members on their way to get their meals. Each and every one of them that he asked, from varying different settlements, all answered the same, that they hadn't spotted any staff all day. As much as they were a minor threat to the human beings living inside the infinite IKEA, the absence of the store's only other residents kept playing on Winston's mind. Whatever was going on, the staff seemingly vanishing couldn't mean anything good. And so he decided to venture out into the aisles to figure out what exactly was going on. What he found was unlike anything anyone had ever seen in SCP-3008 before. It took Winston several long and uneventful hours to catch even a momentary glimpse of a staff member. He almost felt like someone trekking through a forest looking to get a sighting of Bigfoot or some other elusive urban legend. But as the third hour became the fourth, he spotted a hint of movement between the aisles. Following at a safe distance, listening out for the slightest sounds, Winston couldn't help but think he detected the noise of something heavy being dragged along the stone floor. Peeking out from between the aisles, he saw them. A huge group of staff members were all huddled in a display dining room, only there was something different about all of them. They still retained their recognizable tall and humanoid shapes, with long, disproportionate limbs, but there was something smeared over the staff, a dark, oily black substance that seemed to melt through the floor as it dripped off them. From his hiding place, Winston soon saw where that substance had originated from. The thing being dragged across the floor was another staff member, 
looking more normal than the rest. One of the others, covered in the corrosive sludge, was gripping it by the collar of its IKEA polo shirt and bringing it through the group. Meanwhile, the ordinary creature was thrashing and flailing its lengthy arms around, trying to get free. It was dragged up to a staff member in the middle of the group, which turned and shocked Winston at the strange sight of it. This staff member, evidently the leader, had a face, or rather, it was wearing a mask. SCP-035 was now firmly affixed to the slender, faceless being, its expression locked in a wide grin that seemed to convey a twisted sense of glee. Its black secretion didn't seem to be affecting its new host in the same way it usually did. The body of the staff member it was now piloting didn't seem to dissolve. As the uncorrupted staff creature was presented to the masked leader, SCP-035 compelled its newfound followers to restrain their prisoner. The workers within SCP-3008 didn't have much in the way of their own free will, or even personalities to speak of. They did, however, seem to share some sort of connection to each other, a hive mind of sorts. So presented with a powerful psychic force like the Possessive Mask, the entity had been able to not only take over one of the staff members as its new host, but spread its influence to the others. And while Winston watched horrified, it unknowingly demonstrated this. The captive staff member was grabbed and held by the others, its long arms and legs pulled apart. The huddled group lifted it up off the floor so that it couldn't free itself and run off into the endless aisles of furniture. Wearing SCP-035, the leader extended an arm, black ooze dripping from it, the droplets burning holes in the floor as it reached towards the faceless head of the restrained staff member. It placed a large hand over the faceless head of the captive, more of the corrosive secretion passed on to the newest addition to SCP-035's growing army. As the black substance spread over the staff member, so did the influence of the possessive mask force its way into another vessel. I'm telling you, I know what I saw! Winston protested, after recounting the events to the other settlers back at Cookware. There's something else out there! Something new and dangerous, and it's infecting the staff! Oh, that's ridiculous, replied Bryce one of the survivors who had been there much longer. I've been here for years and I've never even heard of such a thing, they yelled. I saw it with my own eyes, Winston argued. It has a small army of them already under its control. Even if what you're saying is true, someone else chimed in. What does it matter? We've already got barriers that keep the staff out and they only attack at night anyways. Surely, even if this mask thing really is in control of them now, who cares? As if on cue, one of the lookouts at the cookware settlement started frantically trying to get everyone's attention. They pointed to the ominous glow coming from just beyond the nearby aisles filled with wardrobe frames. An orange flicker was visible, even under the lights of the store which were still on, although blocked a little by thick plumes of black smoke rising up towards the ceiling. That's lighting, the lookout said in shocked disbelief, stating the name of another nearby community of survivors that was named after an IKEA store department. Something must have happened over there, Bryce declared. Uh, maybe it's an electrical fire that's gotten out of control. It's them, Winston said solemnly. It can't be them, the older survivor snapped. The lights are still on. It's still daytime in the store and the staff never attacked during the day. I don't think the rules are the same anymore. Frustrated, Winston continued to argue. There's no telling what that mask did to them. Uh, perhaps. Bryce was trying desperately to come up with a suggestion, but was clearly grasping at straws. Uh, what if this mask can be reasoned with? If it's more intelligent than the staff, we can... We can negotiate. Uh, there must be something it wants. What do you think it wants? It wants this place, this Ikea! And now it has control of enough staff to form a small army. You think it's just gonna stop there? It's coming for all of us, and it won't stop until it's got the whole store under its control. And if it has to wipe us out to do that? Well, it looks like it's not hesitating. So what do we do? A voice called meekly. Winston turned to see the townsfolk of Cookware had gathered, all looking up at him with terrified expressions on their faces. He gazed back at each one of them, then looked back over at the smoke now towering over where lighting had been and was now in flames. Who knew how many of the settlers there were still alive, and how long it would be before SCP-035 and its new army did the same to Cookware? Something had to be done. We need to get the word out, Winston announced to the other survivors. I need our fastest to run over to the other towns in the store. You each take one, you pass on the message, and then you come back. You know your way around well enough so avoid anywhere you'd normally see staff. Even if they haven't been corrupted, we can't chance it. Why don't we tell the other settlements? Somebody in the crowd called. You tell them what's going on. 
You say that something has come here to threaten this Ikea and our way of life. This place isn't where any of us first came from, but it's all our home now. It's provided for us, but now it needs us to defend it, Winston explained. And how exactly are we going to do that? Bryce asked. The lights had gone out, but although night had fallen, it wasn't dark yet. Standing with their fellow survivors from numerous other settlements, the residents of SCP-3008 had fashioned flaming torches from the legs of IKEA desks and tables. And that wasn't all. They were carrying makeshift weapons. Some had spears crafted using curtain rails with sharp kitchen implements fashioned to the end. Others had wardrobe doors in their hands to act as rudimentary shields. They were hardly warriors, but as an army of corrupted staff members lurched out of the darkness towards them, each survivor of SCP-3008 knew what they had to do. At the front of the army towered the staff member with SCP-035 on its faceless head. The possessive mask's wide grin had shifted, now a long frown, almost one of disgust at the amassed settlers who opposed it. As it raised an elongated arm to command its horde, Winston raised a curtain rail spear into the air. FOR IKEA! he yelled as the residents of SCP-3008 charged. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium anomalous merchandise. Now go check out What If SCP-343 War SCP-035 and SCP-173 Surprises SCP-3008 Shoppers for more anomalous surprises.